Great. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good Friday morning. Welcome to the uh, the COSA uh, meeting. COSA is the committee uh, on on offshore science and assessment, and we're uh, advising and and uh, uh, trying to help our colleagues at uh, at Boehm with uh, some of their environmental assessments. I want to welcome everyone to the meeting on Friday in a somewhat cloudy Washington. I guess it is, but there we go. Um, so, uh, Jonathan, we'll start off before Rodney and I are going to give very brief uh, introductions, and and they are going to be uh, brief because it's the second day of the meeting. But, uh, Jonathan, you had a couple of housekeeping things you wanted to take care of? Sure, yeah, just very quickly. Um, first of all, I think the cloudy raininess means that cool weather is mm -hmm. on the way. I think that's how meteorology works. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for a great uh, meeting yesterday. Um, just to continue it, um, a, a couple of things that I think would be very helpful going uh, forward today is that first of all, if um, when people are speaking, it would be very helpful if you uh, introduce yourself because uh, not everyone uh, can see the name cards that we have on the table. Um, and if you're online, uh, uh, that can be very helpful just to uh, know who's speaking. Um, additionally, uh, and we apologize for this, uh, for folks in the room here, there's only uh, the the room camera up there really only points at that side of the room. So if you're on uh, this side of the room, we can't really get you on uh, screen. So um, if you are able to join the, the Zoom, uh, with your video, just with a video, without audio, we can uh, spotlight you uh, while you're speaking so that uh, everyone can see you. Um, lastly, all I just wanted to say was that um, a number of folks have asked how they can uh, get in touch with the uh, profile authors for additional feedback uh, some further thoughts that they've had, and I've been informed, and and correct me if this is wrong, but uh, you are free to uh, communicate with them as you um, uh, as you wish. Usually, the the formula for Bohm uh, email addresses is first name dot last name at bohm dot gov. Uh, if if there's a particular individuals that you want to get in contact with, um, you can just let us know and we can um, forward you uh, email addresses. Alternatively, if you want to just send uh, um, feedback just to us and we can forward that along to the appropriate individuals, that uh, works as well. So whatever works for you and and uh, we're very happy uh, to have people engaged um, during and beyond the meeting. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Great, wonderful. And, and I'll just uh, add to that um, because I believe in the past, uh, the, the academies appreciated if you, if you would CC the academies on your, even if you're reaching out individually, just not, not for anything other than for them to be able to kind of keep track of the amount of communications and the productivity of the, of the, of the, um, the interactions. Uh, so with that, I, again, welcome. I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm uh, um, the chair of the the COSA committee here, and um, we've uh, we had a great day yesterday. We had a lot of a lot of good discussion. We're hoping to continue with that uh, today, and uh, I'll hand it to Rodney uh, to make uh, his introductions. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Rodney Cluck, uh, chief of the Environmental Studies Program for Bohm. Um, I agree. I think yesterday was a really productive day. Uh, I thought the presentations that were given by the Bohm scientists were right on. I thought they were all well done. And uh, yeah, the committee comments and the invited guests, I thought were very thoughtful and helpful. Uh, so yeah, let's tee it up for another another good day and, and go forward. That's about all I have to say. Thanks. Fantastic. Great. So um if that's all right with everyone, we might jump in just a couple of minutes early and and start. We can we can uh, lead off with. Uh, let me get there the the right um, presentation here. Out, we're going to uh, hear from the Gulf of Mexico Regional Office with uh, Mel Melanie Mitchell. Is, is she on now? Yeah. 
Good morning. Yes, I'm uh, here. Super. Well, uh, good morning, Melanie, and uh, welcome. And and uh, please, uh, you're you're welcome to to give your introduction. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Melanie Mitchell, and I'm the Environmental Studies and Outreach Coordinator, um, Section Chief for the Gulf of Mexico. This is a fairly new position in the Gulf, and I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude and appreciation for all the work that has been done by the Gulf's team to bring together this year's Studies Development Plan. With a special thanks to Melanie Demore, our studies coordinator. She is integral to this program and has kept it all moving. So thank you, Melanie. Additionally, I would like to thank Mary Kate Rogner DeWitt and Alan Brooks for their presentations today on their profiles. Uh, the Gulf has put forward eight profiles for consideration this year. Focal areas in no particular order being air quality, environmental justice, cultural resources green hydrogen, and biological resources. The two profiles you'll be hearing more about today are oil and gas vessel strike risk analysis, cetaceans in the northern Gulf of Mexico with a focus on the endangered rices and sperm whale. And secondly, the offshore wind energy facilities impact on hydrodynamics and primary production in the Gulf. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that's a... Uh, a theme here this week. So obviously a very important uh, portion of the uh, studies development plan. These two profiles were chosen due to their complexity and the Gulf's need to address these issues timely and thoroughly in our NEPA and consultation processes. We very much look forward to the meaningful feedback I know this group is going to provide. A little bit of background, the Gulf is a highly industrialized basin with many sensitive resources. BOEM is responsible for authorizing multiple activities in the Gulf and informing effective and enforceable mitigation of potential effects while ensuring compliance with uh, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act or OXLA, as well as a variety of other environmental statutes I'm sure we're all familiar with. Our scientists and studies are deliberately focused on the outcomes that may be directly applied to our operational needs and are informed by the questions and concerns raised by industry, federal resource agencies, states, and the public. The Gulf is actively supporting all programs that BOEM manages. And to meet these legal mandates under OXLA and the other statutes, the region is dependent upon applied science. It is the backbone of our research program and it informs responsible development of OCS resources. As you hear more about each of our study profiles, please keep this in mind. We're looking to you for recommendations to improve this applied resource management in areas where there is a paucity of information and a high cost to conducting research. Innovation is key, and we hope to leverage your experience in identifying these low risk and creative solutions to these real world issues. And with that, I will yield the floor. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, that introduction and overview, Mel uh, Melanie. Um, just as for our, our guests and people that are, are joining us today, the structure we usually follow with these is a, is a presentation from the BOEM scientists. And then we, uh, at, we for sev several of them, we have invited uh, guests who have reviewed the uh, proposal and are experts in the field. And we'll ask them to, to comment and give their perspectives and, and, and raise any questions they might have. And then we'll uh, turn to the COSA committee to follow up with any more uh, questions that the committee might have in discussion, and 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 the uh, the purpose is to 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 help the the scientists uh, uh, with with critical and constructive uh, review. So um, with that, uh, if would would Mary uh, Kate be ready to go? If if she is, we can uh, cue cue her up. Sure. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Perfect. And should I share my screen? Is that how? Uh, whichever you prefer. You can share it or or our, uh, our trustee. I can share it. Hold on. I have a lot of screens. So <laughs> let uh, me just figure out which one to share. Sometimes that can be a, a little bit of a, a challenge. If you'd rather ha have a uh, 
have Zoe or, or Jonathan drive it, we'd be glad to. And you could just say advance the slide. We can see. We'll see if it works. <laughs> okay. Um, can you see the presentation? Yes. Great. First, of what you can tell it's Friday morning. So everyone's <laughs> right on our game. All right. Yes. Thank Perfect. Thank you so much. Hold on. Okay. So I want to thank everybody um, for being here this morning. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all about a topic that has been on my mind for the past couple of years now, and I know is a, a very hot topic on a lot of people's minds um, all over uh, the uh, nation. And so just a little background about myself. My name is Mary Kate Roganer DeWitt. I am um, from the Gulf of Mexico region in the Office of the Environment in the Physical Chemical Sciences Unit as a water quality subject matter expert. Um, I have my PhD in oceanography. I am a biogeochemist by trade. So this um, whole development of a profile on hydrodynamic impacts has been a bit of a, a learning experience for me, which has been really fun. And I'm really looking forward to all of the thoughts that you all have um, on how to make this uh, profile and hopeful study um, the best it can be. So with that, I'll start on some background. Um, offshore wind facilities reduce local wind speeds by drawing energy from surface winds and the turbines alter the turbulence of currents flowing past the structures. Both effects may alter regional and local hydrodynamics, resulting in impacts to water quality and prior productivity. I have a snapshot of a few um, representative studies that have been done over the past few years um, on the hydrodynamic, on the impacts of um, offshore wind on hydrodynamics in the various um, locations, one of which is the National Academy study that was done last year um, on Nantuck Nantucket Shoals. Um, these are just a, a small representative of the studies. I'm aware that there are many others. Um, I chose the ones that were most aesthetically pleasing uh, to put on a uh, PowerPoint presentation. So to date, BOEM has funded studies to analyze the impacts of offshore wind energy facilities on physical and oceanographic processes, specifically in the California current, Nantucket Shoals, and Mid-Atlantic Bight. You also heard yesterday um, from Alice about a potential future study in the California current area as well. Um, conditions in these regions differ from the physical and biological dynamics of the Gulf of Mexico, so the relevance of the impacts found in the other regions to the Gulf of Mexico is unknown. Um, as many of you know, the Gulf of Mexico is a highly productive, broad continental shelf system with complex hydrodynamics due to multiple river plumes with varying spatial and chemical distributions, the loop current, loop current eddies, and seasonally driven shelf circulation resulting in stratification along the shelf. And we have a nice depiction on the right of uh, sea surface temperature from March of 1994, it was a really nice snapshot I saw um, from the LSU Earth uh, Lab, and it really depicts uh, the loop current really well um, in the spring. And these complex oceanographic regimes make the Gulf of Mexico prone to low oxygen conditions, and research in the North Sea, which is a similar low, ox low oxygen prone system, shows that wind energy facilities can further decrease dissolved oxygen concentrations. So BOEM information needs, I know this slide is a little busy. Um, and as Melanie mentioned, the Gulf of Mexico is a heavily utilized and industrialized basin. It supports oil and gas exploration and development, renewable energy development, commercial and recreational fishing, shipping, military operations, and tourism. This study would help BOEM estimate the potential impacts of offshore wind energy facilities during the various stages of construction and or operation on the hydrodynamics, water quality, and prior productivity of the Gulf of Mexico. As per the Renewable Energy Modernization Rule, oops, jump too far ahead. As per the Renewable Energy Modernization Rule, BOEM needs to ensure that renewable energy activities on the outer continental shelf are conducted in a safe and environmentally sound manner. To ensure safe and sustainable offshore wind development in the Gulf, BOEM needs to understand and estimate the potential impact of offshore wind development on local and regional hydrodynamics, water quality, and prime productivity. These factors serve as the foundational building blocks of the ecosystem influencing both fisheries and protected species in the area. This study will provide information to stakeholders, will be included as part of 
the impact analyses pursuant of NEPA, Endangered Species Act, and the Magnuson-Stevens Act, and potentially guide mitigation measures. Additionally, this modeling effort would support open source modeling tools, which would be made publicly available to allow for the transfer of model simulations to other regions and to provide code base for future projects to build upon. And this objective aligns really well with administration priorities to make federally funded research and development accessible to the public. So for the study objectives, um, this profile proposes to use model simulations to evaluate the potential effects of offshore wind facilities on hydrodynamics, water quality, and prior production within the designated wind energy areas in the Gulf of Mexico. To do this, this profile proposes to synthesize available data relevant to offshore wind energy and environmental parameters to inform the modeling process comprehensively. After that, um, the study team would execute model simulations using sophisticated algorithms and methodologies to simulate the complex interactions between offshore wind facilities and marine ecosystems. To explore various, uh, and additionally explore various construction and or operation scenarios in addition to the decommissioning phase to anticipate and understand the potential changes in hydrodynamic water quality and prior productivity under different operational conditions for offshore wind facilities. If possible, um, due to funding and time, this project would also potentially incorporate climate change related variables into the model simulations to anticipate how offshore wind facilities may interact with altered environmental conditions over time. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, this modeling effort would support open source modeling tools. BOEM would have the capability to rerun the model simulations internally in the future or provide code base and model configurations to future vendors, contractors for further development for follow along projects. So for the potential methods, um, we are interested in using a Gulf of Mexico regional model modeling approach. The first step would be synthesize um, and gather diverse data sets, which would include satellite imagery, current profiles, meteorological measurements, geophysical data, and biogeochemical data in the relevant locations. After that, um, integrate those data sets to inform an existing coupled hydrodynamic nutrient phytoplankton zooplankton detritus model, and then use the synthesized data to enhance the resolution accuracy of the existing coupled model ensuring a comprehensive representation of environmental factors. And then finally conduct simulations for different um, scenarios to understand the impact of offshore wind facilities. So the various scenarios that we have um, proposed and are interested in would be modeling baseline conditions before the installation, routine operations, which could potentially include um, construction and then final operations, and then potentially include the decommission phase. And then finally, if possible, think about incorporating climate change variables into the modeling framework. And this would potentially set up the framework to forecast how offshore wind facilities interact with anticipated changes in climatic conditions to include sea level rise, uh, temperature variations, and altered precipitation patterns, which are incredibly important in the Gulf, um, especially due to its uh, hurricane frequencies. And for the research questions, um, they are how could potential offshore wind energy facilities alter local and regional hydrodynamic processes? How might changes in hydrodynamic processes impact water quality and the subsequent prior production throughout the area? And how might these changes, uh, how might these impacts change after decommission? And with that, I will take any questions. Great. And Thank you that. very much. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have a couple of invited guests. Uh, so I'll, I'll call on uh, first my my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Chesse Chen from uh, UMass uh, Dartmouth. And also if, if Rob uh, Hartland from the Pacific Northwest National Science uh, Laboratory uh, or National Laboratory is, is online, if, if they would like to queue up and uh, um, uh, provide their comments and, and questions, that'd be grand. Um, is that Rob there? Yeah, uh, yeah. super. Uh, I don't see Chen's there too? Chen's, okay. Chen's here, I see him. Oh, great. 
Um, Dr. Chen, do you, would you like to start off? Hi, hi everyone. I was uh, Chen from UMSD. Okay. Nice to see everyone. Yeah. So, you want me to give some comments? <laughs> On the proposal we just heard, yes. Yeah, I was saying, you know, I look at the modeling part, I know I was a modeler. I think uh, Bob Headlands here, he also a modeler, okay? You know, so then I was thinking about, you know, regarding impact, I really, if you took the wind farm, please, I was starting in the Northeast region, we find you need to have a wind, wind terminal resolving model. You know, you, you use the pyration to do that, but most things over there, you know, you can see the, you know, it's kind of wind termite and the fluid interaction is very small scale. Also, it's different from one to another. So, you no know, use of pyration is really hard uh, to get this kind of impact done because they get a small mixing, they, they get an ocean wake, you know, so lots of things we had to do. Another thing is very important for modeling. You have to think about the downwind wake. Okay, you need to have a downwind wake can be done because depending on the number of termites you put in there, if you have a small termite, probably not very significant. If you have a hundred termites, they probably very significant, particularly for Gulf of Mexico. Okay, Gulf of Mexico there, you know, a lot of things is wind driving circulation because Gulf of Mexico ties very small. But for ocean side, inertial oscillation is very critical. They get a daily inertial oscillation over there, but then wind can be really affected as oscillation. So then you put this wind termite in there, if you don't have a wind resolving model, so I don't know you know what impact you get probably, you know, is the reason because the model can mislead it. Okay, you know, I'm a model, I know. That's why I think it's an assessment should be done for ensemble modeling. You can use a different model, at least you have to have two model running the region. So then you get some kind of, you know, you know, some kind of information to the people, understand, you know, what a difference the model results is, you know, so then we know the uncertainty. Right, that's the basic comments I have. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have not been working in the Gulf of Mexico for long. I think about headlines are much better than me. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll 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 turn to Bob then, please. So I'm I'm Rob Hetland from the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, before I joined PNNL, I was a professor at Texas A&M and worked in the Northern Gulf quite a bit. So I've got some local experience. In my new job, I'm working with some people who are looking at. Uh, wind farms on the west coast, and so we're dealing with some of the same problems that you're uh, you're looking at here. So um, I would like to uh, start up by just basically agreeing with Chen. I think some of the issues that he brought up are exactly the the right kinds of things to think about. Thinking about the the wakes of the wind farms, which, given the lease areas, could be fairly significant. Um, needs that means you need to have. Um, an atmospheric model, and you need to have probably a hierarchy of models that can resolve kind of the, maybe not the turbine scale, but there are ways to parameterize the kind of the wind farm scale um, and, and looking at the, the, the wake of the wind farms. And again, as Chen points out, the, um, the time scales in the in the northern gulf are fairly complicated and you know in the summer there's a strong land sea breeze that just creates short time scales uh that drives strong uh near inertial currents in the gulf um so the space scales are small the time scales are small um there can be a lot of interaction between these fairly quick time scales in the in the ocean and the atmosphere with fronts that occur in the northern gulf due to instabilities in the mississippi river plume that can lead to very strong vertical motions uh, that would be you know have implications for for shelf biogeochemistry uh and so i guess i'm i'm also suggesting to have a hierarchy of models some quite fine scale uh and some over sort of the broader you know texas louisiana shelf uh more generally um, and I think that you need to have coupled ocean atmosphere 
uh, models because the you know the the interplay between um, the wake and the fields can be uh, quite complicated. Um, I also um, wonder to to what extent the you know I I think it's a, it's an open question to whether the actual structures are more impactful to the circulation and the mixing versus the 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 the, the wakes from the the wind farms, um, and so that's something that we just needs to be examined um, and probably for each site separately because the answer could possibly mm -hmm. change. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to reach out to your Department of Energy colleagues because they've been developing some of these modeling capabilities that would be really useful to use in, in this case. So would that be you? That would be, uh, I could get you in touch with okay. people. Thank you. And I guess one question for you, since you brought it up about the um, coupled ocean atmosphere model, and this goes back to showing my, um, this being a completely different area for me, um, would those, could those be also coupled to a biogeochemical model? Yeah. So okay. um, I would, I would say that, you know, a reasonable choice for that would be the coast modeling system and the, um, and the, uh, the ocean side of that is ROMS, the Regional Ocean Modeling System, which may be something that you are considering for your ocean model anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, and I think that, you know, FECOM has kind of this, right, Chan, you guys also couple with WARF. So I think you know, there are a number of ways to do this. And whatever ocean model you have, will be able to include a NPZD model. I would suggest that I would start with the physical system. Okay. And then add the add, once you kind of have a, uh, some good simulations, add in the. That's what we did when, with our with our uh, Mississippi plume studies. We created the physical model first, and then once that was sort of set, we had some good physical simulations. We would add on the biogeochemistry afterwards. Perfect. Thank you. But it, this, this is a hard, super hard problem. And I think I'm really interested to see what you guys come up with. And Jack, Excellent. Has, Jack has his hand up, I see. He's gonna- Does he? Oh, well, that's super. Yeah. We'll, we'll jump to Jack. Uh, go ahead, Jack. Great, thank you, Mary-Kate. And good to see you, Chen and uh, Bob, thanks. Um, so we had a long discussion yesterday in the in the Pacific modeling uh sdp to think about what rob just put his finger on which is the is it just the wind reduction and its effects on the upper ocean or must we also include the in water hydrodynamic interaction with the flow structures and the so far the experience on the west coast and rob can comment again is that maybe they're you know a few percent effects but we just don't know, so we, we need to figure that out. So I, I couldn't tell from the write-up whether you were thinking about including the in-water part of that. So that's my first question. My second one was also alluded to by both Chen and Rob is this, the signal-to-noise ratio. You know, you've got this complex area, you've got these uh, potential eddies and things creating up and down motions that we're interested in changes that the that the wind reduction might might influence so what are your thoughts about you know doing a before and after study and what's the approach on that um so this came up during the star team reviews um and since this is just at the profile stage um and during those discussions if this profile were to get selected to be funded um and then turn into a study. I think that that would have to get added into the somewhere in the statement of work, trying to figure out which one we would focus on, um, just because funds are limited, and try and figure out how to best address both of those topics if it is possible. Sorry, I know that was kind of like a roundabout way to answer, <laughs> not an answer to your question, um, but yes, I do know that those are both things that need to be thought about and investigated. Yeah, I think I think Mary Kate along those lines that interaction with the 
group in the Pacific looking mm -hmm. at the same would be terrific. So, uh, Jack, one of the one of the different well, I don't know what they're planning to do in the Gulf, but one of the things about the uh, in on the Pacific is that it's floating offshore wind farms. Mm -hmm. Which you know then are then aren't attached to the bottom or aren't attached to the bottom in the same way, um, and I imagine that the structure in the Gulf would be attached. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know the other strange thing about the Gulf is that if you know if you've ever been out there, you are never out of sight from a structure. It seems like right. Mm -hmm. There's structures everywhere, um, so that maybe gives you a clue as to what the impact of structures might be on the circulation. You know, we're not wringing our hands about oil rigs altering, uh, you know, large scale currents. Um, similarly, I, you know, I, um, my guess, if I had to guess, and and I and I think this should, this is just a guess. If so I'd be happy to be proved wrong. Is that the that the wakes will not be impactful. And the reason I think that is because uh, if you had sort of a persistent wind that would create a, uh, a reduction in the wind stress that would cause wind stress curl at the edges, which might cause upwelling and downwelling, but it would be hard to imagine that those wakes would be so persistent to, to drive a sort of a mean circulation. The winds will be shifting, so the wakes will be shifting perpetually, the current underneath will be moving. Um, so my hypothesis is that the wind wakes won't be sort of measurably impactful on shelf biogeochemistry. That other thing, you know, that the you know the larger scale drivers are going to win out. Um, these are pretty big wind farms, and the shelf is fairly sensitive to winds. So in this region, I think I I could very well be wrong, but. Um, but I, my guess is that the effects will be subtle and hard to find mm -hmm. because there's so much noise. There's, and the, you know, our models are only so good. Uh, there's, you know, there's the there's the impacts of the wind farm, and then our ability to understand what those are with models. And that the second thing is much weaker, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I don't know if we're going to be like if uh, this, is, this is a very challenging modeling problem, and uh, so predicting these subtle changes might be hard to do. That's just something to keep in mind, right? That it's a big, it's a challenging problem. It's, it's a really, um, it's a great, great science problem, but hard. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll throw it open to the, uh, to the, to the rest of the COSA committee to make a, uh, comments if anyone has one I, and actually I'd, I'd like to start off myself because the discussion's been a, a lot on on the physical modeling and the wind farm but the 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 proposal also had a primary productivity uh, component in it that hasn't really been touched on too much uh, so I'd like to hear you know a little bit more about that and uh, and also uh, in the context I know that the, the Gulf is a a, a a kind of unique environment down there, but it is um, just for example for bluefin tuna. It's one of the the key spawning grounds for the North Atlantic bluefin tuna stock right off that area. So the the wind structure uh, for larval distribution, the primary productivity are are pretty critical. For uh, that's just one example of a really key um, stock that that there's a debate about whether it spawns anywhere else uh, along the coast. So pretty important to try and get this, this right and figure out as much as we can about it. Yes. Thank you. Those are really good points. Um, for primary productivity specifically, uh, we are interested in, as you mentioned, you know, like potential cascading effects from the hydrodynamics leading to water quality impacts and leading to primary productivity um, that being said, I don't, since this is such in the beginning stages of kind of determining what we would do, um, we, not me, it would not be me, we would kind of potentially compete this out. We're essentially would be leaving that as open as possible um, for the, uh, however, this is 
the venue for this is completed out um, to be able to propose various ways of evaluating primary productivity. So I don't know if you had more specific questions about our thoughts on primary productivity. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have more concrete information about that. Uh, no, that that's all right, but certainly something to, to think about who maybe you could partner with to, to, to get that. Uh, Karen, please. I just have a quick question. Water quality. What do you mean by water quality? Are you talking about the nutrients? Are you talking about the temperature? Are you talking about the, the salinity? So it'd basically be, it would be everything. So doing all of the regular suite of water quality measurements, whether it be nutrients, we wouldn't be doing the, the measurements, but we, I left it broad because we don't know all the existing data. So we're trying, we would like to compile all of the data that is out there to include dissolved oxygen, salinity, temperature, um, turbidity, chlorophyll concentrations, if that's available. I know that um, there are some, you know, CMAP, the NOAA Groundfish Survey does collect data out there. Um, I know the National Data Buoy Center buoys are out there. Um, a few NASA satellites. So basically compile all of the existing data that is available in the area and then use that to then inform um, the models to best simulate. So that's what we, what I meant by um, water quality, uh, potentially look at, you know, if there is suspended sediment from different turbine wakes um, and that sort of thing. So yes. Yeah, so when you say quality to me, that sort of implies something about whether it's good or not goodness or does it contain some kind of harmful algal bloom or does it have something bad in it rather than it being hydrographic characteristics for example or the nutri you know like that I, I guess I'm just not as an oceanographer which you are too but I'm not used to hearing water quality used to describe chlorophyll concentration nutrients you know just dissolved oxygen that kind of stuff so I was just wondering what exactly you were talking about so maybe it's a good idea to to define that okay thank you i see i see rob has his his hand up but i i will like to comment on that with, with following up with what karen was saying because the area of the wind farm proposed development in the the gulf i think it overlaps pretty well with the hypoxic uh event that was down there Cor correct so is there i think it's uh, a little I, further west then that hypoxic zone cruise typically goes out and reaches unless it's a significant, significant hypoxic zone. Um, typically, I know Nancy and them really don't go that much further than um, the Louisiana Texas border. So it, it, it if if it is, but in, in a well, I guess it's relative then. But if there is a change in the, particularly the wind, the current structure, the upwelling, and and stratification that. That hypoxic, maybe linking it in with that would be something that would be really yes, uh, yes. useful in applying it. Uh, Rob, did you want to comment? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, water quality typically means bad water quality. And that would be like hypoxia, algal blooms, eutrophication, you know, so like too much plant, too much chlorophyll, too much plankton. Um, and so, in, you know, in the Northern Gulf, we typically think of, water quality is being driven by nutrient pollution. And uh, in, in terms of primary productivity in the Gulf, my guess is that the, you know, the, the major driver is anthropogenic nutrient pollution. The Haber-Bosch process is double, you know, is, is, is increase the amount of organic nitrogen on the world by, by um, 100%, right? It's doubled. And uh, the Mississippi drains the, the, the bread basket. And so there's just a lot of nutrient pollution coming down the Mississippi that ends up in the Gulf. That's one of the factors that is believed to drive uh, hypoxia, uh, but it certainly drives eutrophication. And um, I just, you know, that's, gonna, that's the major thing, right? Um, wind farms will perturb that signal. Most of the, you know, the biological activity that happens will happen over where the you know the rivers enter the Gulf, right? So that's going to be you know. So this is off of off of Galveston is kind of at the, at the end of of that um, of that region. One of the reasons that and one of the reasons they don't um, 
go much past the Texas Louisiana border in the hypoxia surveys is because that's just where the hypoxia ends. Mm -hmm. Nancy does her transects, and when she does a transect, I think no it's what two. She waits two transects where she hasn't seen hypoxia. That's what it was when I was out there. So um, I, for, I forget how she does it exactly, but yeah, I think that it probably, it's probably two because I think that she's had one and then it starts up again because mm -hmm. it can be sort of patchy out in 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 the West, and that's pretty consistent with our modeling too. Um, that's good to know. Uh, one of the one of the big drivers of hypoxia also is just the presence of the freshwater plume, which could be influenced mm -hmm. by uh, by the the wind wake uh, of, of turbines. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy is the hypoxia can vary, very, you know, I have diel patterns, so I think that's a, a very another additional complicating factor in that area. Yeah, and I and I wonder to what extent the you know um, there's there certainly could be a lot of small scale influences, but like I don't think the large scale patterns will be disrupted very much just because they're driven by other 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 processes. Uh, in terms of the question about um, uh, swordfish larvae and fisheries, that's a really complicated problem. Most like so an NPZD model would not address fish. Or fish larvae. You'd have to have a separate study for that that would uh, track the passive particles or track, you know, track them if they could weakly swim so that they had vertical migrations where they could exploit different currents. They, that, that's, a, that's another difficult problem, especially if you don't know what the behavior of the larvae is. Um, the NPZD model gets to sort of basic water quality issues like, is it hypoxic? Is it eutrophic? Um, what are the nutrient levels and things like that? Great, Thank thanks, you. Chen. We'll 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 turn to you, to you, and then uh, Ron. Did you have a no? You're all set. So go go ahead, Chen. We'll leave. Yeah, the... I'm, you know, look about the hypoxia. You know, the offshore wind farm. If you put a wind farm there, and the one key issue is the stratification will be changes. Uh, particularly was on the downwind wake side. Because this will change the season, downwind weak side, the stratification, like we do northeast region. So we have a cold pool, you know, in the bottom. You know, people have to worry about you no know, wind fan increase mixing, then of course the cold pool and the temperature increase. But the fisheries, you know, a lot of fish will stay in the cold pool. But if we come out to find out, you know, because the stronger downwind weak side, the wind becomes weak on the lee side. That's why stratification becomes stronger. So for Gulf of Mexico, hypoxia is a really critical issue for water quality. Okay, you no, know, because your oxygen can be get very low, but stratification becomes stronger, so hypoxia probably could become the worst, you know, could be affected hypoxic conditions. So I think it should be do some assessment, initial assessment in the modeling, see how this thing can be affected. You know, you know, I, I agree with the about Helen, you no know, MP, you know, you know. MPZ model is not able to resolve this kind of water quality issue. You know, also, I think there's a lot, lot of model has been developed right now. You have a biogeochemistry model, include a the traffic food wetmark. So you can use this model, include a, not only for low traffic food web, you also look about DO, you know, pH, you know, like all the you know, PCO2 or others. So I think the suggest the modeling should use the model a little bit more complicated model than the MPZ model. Okay, that's all of my comments. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Well if there are, are no more comments or, or questions, then we'll 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 turn to our next presentation. But thank you very much. Thank you, uh Rob and, and, and Chen and a great presentation. a really interesting study and a very, very important one. So Thank you so much. Forward. Oh, and Rodney has a comment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention one, one thing, and I guess it's really to our team because it was a comment that Bob made about reaching out to Department of Energy. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly the work they're doing. I'm, I understand some of the work that PNNL is doing. But I think uh, since we have these um, hydrodynamic challenges in all of our regions, and, you know, Atlantic work, and it was just a workshop this week, right? Uh, in, in the Gulf, in the, in the Pacific, I think it'd be, uh, well, and in the future, it's going to be in the territories too. So I think it'd be worth it, Alice, Mary-Kate, to have a coordination call. Uh, and I, I know who to reach out to in, in DOE. 
um, <clears throat> and they have lots of money. But then, no, I don't know how to reach out to the DOE. Partner in leveraging, it's one of our pillars of success, Kevin, right? Uh, but but I, and we can have these coordination calls and perhaps also uh, talk to our friends at, at, at PNNL moving forward. So I think that might be a wise move. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Well, uh, then we'll uh, we'll move on to uh, to Alan Alan Brooks, correct? Yeah. Super. Good morning. Good morning. How how are you doing? Very good. Do you mind pulling up the slides for me, if you don't mind? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Are we... So I'd like right. to. We're all set, Alan. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to acknowledge my fellow teammates on this, Trey and Haley. We're all part of the Biological Sciences Unit in the Gulf of Mexico. If you could go to the first slide. So the focus of this strike risk assessment is going to be on the rice as well, which is shown in that top picture up there. It's the only resident baleen whale in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's critically endangered. Population estimates are less than 100 individual, and the number of I usually see is about 51 left. It, it's very little data exists on their behavior, but it's thought that during the daytime, they spend most of their time at the seafloor foraging, doing deep dives. But during the nighttime, they spend their majority of the time at, at or near the surface within the top 50 feet of the water column. Therefore, that makes them success, susceptible to vessel strikes. And within the Gulf of Mexico, they're found primarily off of the West Florida Shelf in the Eastern planning area but they do have an extension of their range that comes across the Northwest Gulf of Mexico. And that puts them in potential overlap with vessels conducting oil and gas activities. So if you could go to the next slide. So there's a diverse set of vessels that do uh, oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico, and they have a wide range of draft speed and length and all that uh, affects the vessel strike risk. Um, and just some of the vessel types up there, we've got support vessels, supply vessels, drill ships. So just a really diverse suite of things. And estimates vary, but uh, conservatively, BOEM regulated oil and gas vessel activity accounts for pretty much 20 to 25% of all the vessel traffic on the Gulf of Mexico. And BOEM requires vessel operators to implement each derived mitigation measures to protect against vessel strikes. And this is a mouthful, but for example, we apply the vessel strike avoidance and injured and or dead aquatic protected species reporting protocols to permits, plans, and other authorizations. Those include mitigation measures such as requiring uh, vessel operators to maintain a vigilant observation for any whales in the area. If they see any whales, they're required to maintain a minimum separation distance that buffer distance is 500 meters for rhesus whale and 100 meters for sperm whales. In addition, specific to the rhesus whale, they also apply the notification of intent to transit the rhesus whale area. Now, this prevents um, any kind of nighttime transit through the rhesus whale area, which was in that uh, map that was on that first figure in the EPA area. And it also prevents uh, or it requires a vessel speed restriction through that area. So there are a lot of protections that are placed on the vessels um, that are regulate, doing regulated activities from BOEM. Okay, to the next slide. So the 100 meter to 400 meter isobath extending all the way from Florida to Mexico is thought to provide suitable habitat for the rice as well for both their growth and reproduction. And that entire swath, which is shown in the, in the map on the slide here, is, has been proposed as critical habitat for the rice as well. The final ruling for critical habitat is expected uh, next month. So with uh, the rice as well extending over through the Northwest Gulf of Mexico, that puts uh, them potentially in the path of vessels transiting onto and off of the OCS, including vessels traffic going to ports that are heavily used by oil and gas, such as Port Bouchon and Galveston. So therefore, as part of its mission, BOEM needs to assess the potential impacts to rice as well from the traffic that goes through this area. Now, in addition to the rice as well, also of interest for this study is the ESA protected sperm whale. The sperm whale can also be found across the Northwest Gulf of Mexico. So similarly, uh, some same potential issues, 
and their primary uh, core area is off of the Mississippi River in water depths of more than 200 meters. So any type of evaluation for a strike risk for these large whale species is going to be a lot reliant upon the methodology used, the baseline data that are incorporated, and that's not only the whale data, but also the vessel data that's available to be used, and the key assumptions that are made, such as whale behaviors or uh, vessel speeds and vessel drafts. We could go to the next one. So the first objective of this study is to develop a methodology for performing a statistically robust strike risk assessment for vessels conducting oil and gas activity on the OCS. Then once we have that risk methodology developed, the second objective is to provide a risk written synthesis of risk across the entire Northwestern Gulf of Mexico. And that methodology needs, or that written synthesis needs to discuss the statistical model that's used very much detailed in terms of what kind of data are included, whale occurrence data, vessel data, and all the assumptions that were put into it, and any recommendations for going forward. Then an additional objective of this study is to provide a tool that BOEM staff can use to predict risk, given inputs of different vessel activity levels and patterns, or newer information on whale occurrence data, should we, should we get it in the future. Okay, for the next slide. So this study has the benefit of leveraging information from a current BOEM study that's in its final stages. The title of that study is up there, the Vessel Strike Risk to Rice as Whale in the Gulf of Mexico, Review of Previous Methodologies, Information Gaps, and Recommendations for Future Efforts to Predict Strike Risk. So this study conducted a literature review of previous strike risk efforts, they evaluated the data that were included in those strike risk efforts, and then uh, evaluated the strength and weaknesses of both the approaches to the strike risk and the data that were used. And the final report for that is going to come out next month, so it'll be available to inform the study. And with that final report, we should have a good idea, a, com a comprehensive understanding, really, of what's been done to date and what are the current data that are available to be used for this assessment. Okay, for the next slide. So the first question to address in the study is, due to the very wide distribution of whales across the Northwest Gulf of Mexico and the extremely low population numbers, especially for the rice as whale, what is the best way to determine the probability of encounter between an individual whale and a vessel that's conducting a bloom regulated activity? We assume this will require a very sophisticated statistical approach and also a careful assessment of the data, again, both whale and vessel data, and the limitations of those data. Then the second question we have proposed is, once we have the, an idea of the probability of encounter, what is the actual strike risk to the rice's whale or the sperm whale? So this goes beyond just the encounter where we have a whale and a vessel in the same general area, and it, because it needs to take a, account for the vessel characteristics, the activities that the vessel is actually conducting, and any type of whale behavior to avoid the area. So in other words, this, this question is, will the whale actually be in the strike zone of the vessel? Then we're also looking to, to ask what additional information is needed to infer, inform future strike risk analyses in the future, and what tool can BOEM staff use to make strike risk predictions given a set of port locations and ac OCS activity levels? And go to the next slide, please. And of course, we're we're looking for any input that you have. We're very grateful for it. But three th three sec uh, points that we were hoping to get a uh, so special focus on is due to that occurrence data for whales is very limited. Are there are you aware of any efforts out there that have been done for other species that maybe we could leverage to gain insight from to help benefit this study? And then your input on what type of predictive tool might be most useful to help support BOEM's mission. And then lastly, how do you think we should vote, uh, should we should adjust cumulative risk? Not only cumulative risk across the Northwest Gulf of Mexico, but cumulative risk over time from the oil and gas program. And that's my last slide. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Alan. That's a, a, a great presentation, some interesting questions. So we'll, we have uh, three three of the guests uh, that we've invited are uh, online uh, from uh, from Noah, uh, our my colleague and, and friend Dave Wiley, 
and then uh, Laura Barku from the Canadian Health and Wildlife uh, Cooperative, and also uh, Scott Krauss from the New England uh, Aquarium. So, uh, Dave, perhaps we'll start off with, with you, if you could, if you'd care to comment and raise any uh, questions or thoughts, uh, that'd be great to help Alan out. Yeah. Yeah, th thanks, Kevin. I'm, I'm glad to see this real focus on ship strikes for races whales. Um, you know, we had a lot of people here from NOAA have a lot of experience with right whales, and it sounds similar um, for the rice's whales. I'm going to put a couple of papers in, in the chat. Um, one we just finished, Leslie Thorne and I just finished a paper evaluating what is causing ship strikes among East Coast for humpbacks. And despite all the, um, the hoopla and the press, it's, it's not wind farms driving them crazy, it's ship strikes, just as it always has been. Um, so again, this is a, a really ubiquitous problem that needs to be solved. Uh, we've also been, been tagging uh, whales using drones, and I'll put that paper in the um, chat as well. But I think, Jack, um, Chris Zadra from Ocean Alliance is coming down to tag rice as whales using a drone this summer with you guys. So I think you'll get some, some good data out of that. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize is that um, you really need to get information to the mariners about what they're supposed to do and then monitor if they're actually adhering to any policy decisions you guys make. And we've been working with Moses Cluro, and we can now send information to um, the AAS screen on a ship. So for right whales, if ships are, are exceeding the speed limits in the seasonal management areas, um, we can monitor that automatically and then send a message right to their AS screen that says they're going too fast. Um, you can also monitor that because that message is sent every 10 minutes if they don't slow down. So you'll be having a good idea if, if you have compliance or not. So I, I can talk um, more about all those things with you guys offline, but I think those will be really helpful. And, and also we have the Whale Alert app uh, that you can use down there that will uh, let you, um, you know, place your policy management decisions onto a, a map um, that can be seen easily on, ch on charts and you can put sightings or anything else you want into that app uh, in real time. So a bunch of stuff we could talk about offline if you're interested. Great, thank you. And thank you for the papers too. Yeah, we'll circle back with you for sure. Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, how about uh, Laura? Are you are you uh, on? And, and and if so, can you uh, comment, please? Uh, yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Excellent. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm a veterinary pathologist, so at the risk of coming across as a being a hammer looking for a nail, I would like to recommend as a means of ensuring that all of these great measures and um, ensuring that your 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 plan is going to be effective is to ensure that if there are any dead whales that are found in your region that you get a team of uh, well-trained experts out to examine those whales as quickly as possible because necropsy results will obviously be foundational to whether or not your plans are actually becoming effective um, so it's pretty foundational but um, I did have one question um, for your your mitigation measures: Are you um, basing them on mortalities or preventing encounters? It's preventing encounters, and um, those those mitigations are are already in place for the oil and gas vessels currently, the ones that I discussed. But yeah, it's it's for avoidance. Okay, great. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Great. How about uh, Scott from the New England Aquarium? Are you, uh, hello, Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that you guys are working on this. Um, I think it's a probably a much broader problem than anyone realizes, simply because animals like rhesus whales, if they are hit by a ship, will sink. Um, so you're not likely to retrieve them. The... Um, the one thing that I am a little bit worried about is there's quite a bit of misunderstanding, uh, both in the research and in the management communities, about the term risk. And encounter risk is not the same as risk of mortality or risk of injury. Um, and 
it has a little bit to do with the scale of the analysis. So, you know, if a if you were to fine scale a the movement of a ship through an area and look at the probability of encounter of a whale, that encounter probability means that the whale and the ship will occupy the same pixel at the same time. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And the and how big that pixel is. It could be a, a square kilometer, a square mile. I don't, you know, I don't know. So encounter risk is you get them in close proximity to one another. And theoretically, that would, uh, reducing the close encounters would actually reduce risk. That seems like a good plan. However, the one component that seems much more, uh, and is the only one that's really scientifically validated is that the speed of the vessel within the encounter uh, really matters in terms of the potential for injury and lethality. And that is, we don't fully understand that, but it's probably related to the behavior of the animal. If you're in a school zone and you're going 10 miles an hour, that little kid that jumps out in front of the car can actually have the time to run away and you have the time to respond. And if you're going 50 miles an hour through the school zone, the kid is toast. So the the concept of speed needs to be integrated into the risk analyses so that um, it incorporates both the encounter rate and the potential speed of the vessel. There's another component, which is the mass of the vessel. But in the case of the, certainly in the oil and gas business, most of the masses are so excessive with regard to the size of the whale that it, that's not so much of a consideration. But I, I'm just curious about how that plans to be incorporated. I appreciate the fact that you said you wanted to convert encounter risk into relative risk, and I think that's the right approach. But the speed component is one that's uh, quite tricky, and I'm wondering yeah, we, how you're planning to address that. Yeah, we know that that's a, a big factor, and we're not sure at this point with the profile exactly how that's going to be addressed. And uh, similar to what Mary-Kate said previously, uh, as this goes forward, we'll get proposals for how how to do that. But speed is definitely a, a factor that we want to, to think about and consider. We're also, the point you brought up too, we're also very limited because we don't have much behavioral data for the rice as well. Like what type of aversion behavior might they be doing if they're doing any at all? Um, so that's limited and, and that's another factor that I think plays in strongly to the risk, but we might have to make some assumptions there, um, conservative assumptions. It's worth looking at uh, the other balanopterid literature. You know, fin whales are always showing up on the bows of ships coming into New York Harbor. And so the evidence certainly indicates that um, most of the balanopterids are not very alert to the presence of ships nearby, which makes the slower speed maybe all the more important. They do respond, for example, to uh, research or whale watching vessels when they get within, you know, 20 meters or something. But uh, if you're going at a high speed, you might not see any response at all before you hit it. So anyways, that's a, uh, and there is some other literature on the speed com component. I wasn't included in your um, in the synopsis that I read, but we'd be happy. To, I'd be happy to share you with that other, share that other literature with you if you want it. Sure, please, if you would. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. And we'll uh, we'll open it up to the uh, the the COSA committee to see if there are any comments. Uh, I would imagine uh, there are a few. I I do have one myself, uh, and thinking about thinking about risk and strike risk, and also I I know you you said that the the vessels in your introduction are are required to have observers, but I I was wondering if there's going to be some kind of observer component in your your model, like the the number of observers, or uh, so you know, I'm not exactly sure how you would take that into account, although perhaps, uh, you know, weather condition and ability to visually spot these, but would uh, observers be a component within the risk model? That definitely could be a component. I, I hadn't originally thought about that um, at this stage, but that definitely is something to consider. Um, 
in the weather conditions is another thing as well. Um, with the restriction that's currently in place for the rice as well, it's not only a nighttime restriction through the uh, rice as well area, but also if there's low visibility, that restriction is also in place. As place. So uh, visibility will definitely play into the into the model, but observers should as well. That's a good point. Great. Uh, Karen? Well, along the same lines as observers, I was wondering about something like real-time passive acoustic monitoring in the shipping line so that you could tell if they were actually there, if that would go into your modeling or your considerations. The, the problem, well, the problem with the shipping lane is we're such a wide, diverse area and we have so many routes offshore to the different leases. Um, it's unfortunate that it's not a single pathway that we can monitor. Um, it's a really, it's it's kind of a spaghetti map out there across the OCS. Um, once they leave, primarily Port Fushan probably has 40% of the oil and gas vessel traffic, but after it comes out of there, it's uh, all over the OCS. So that, that can be something to be considered as well. Yeah, I wonder if you could, this sounds like a crazy idea, but if you could incorporate some kind of analysis of the cost of make, of developing defined shipping lanes and what would be the economic cost to the vessels to, if they had to follow that at least for part of the way so that you could better constrain where they were and better predict where, you know, if the whales were there and stuff. I mean, I realize that they don't want to do that. They want to go straight from their port out to wherever they're going. But I mean, you know, we, they, you could put some economic analysis in there and find out how much that would cost and whether, you know, time and everything. I don't know. It's an idea. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy? Uh, yeah. Hi, Jeremy Firestone. Uh, first, let me just say hello to, to Dave and Scott. Thanks for joining us. Uh, both great, great uh, resources for you all. Um, one, I, I was a little unclear. You gave us a percentage of ships of from Bohm versus the full Gulf. Do you have that sort of narrowed down into the areas of interest? What what percentage of the ships are are BOEM related? That so we're continuously trying to refine our our vessel information to hone in on what's exactly which ones are ex vessels conducting BOEM regulated activities. Um, we're trying to get better and better data over time, but that's our current estimate is that. And it's a very conservative estimate that 20 to 25 percent of the vessel traffic on the OCS is probably conducting BOEM regulated activities. Again, but that's conservative because the vessel data, much like most data, the vessel data is is messy and, and we're trying to refine it as best we can, but it's a continual process to get that to get that information. Okay. Uh yeah, and I, I would just agree completely with Scott. Speed kills. Um, and, uh, you know, 10 knots, uh, or even a little lower is, is if you, you hit a large whale, you're, you're going to injure it, but, uh, the chances of serious injury are low, uh, at 20 knots, you, you're basically serious injury or death. So, and, and it's just simple, simple physics, uh, going back to our high school physics uh, on force mass and acceleration. And, um, and, and so uh, certainly, and obviously you need to work with, with, uh, you know, NOAA and Coast Guard on, uh, on, on vessel speeds. Uh, as far as getting the basic encounter probabilities, uh, until you know where the whales aggregate, uh, within those areas and the relative areas, it's a little hard to figure out encounter probabilities because you really only you 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 know the density of ships, but you don't really know the density of uh, rice whales in the various areas. So um, that would seem to be the next step uh, in a in a risk analysis. Uh, and other than that, uh, as Scott said, there's speed reduction uh, and I think as you, as you're doing uh, area avoidance, so there are, there are areas in the Atlantic that are uh, designated areas for ships to avoid, and and commercial shippers are pretty pretty good at pretty good at that. So, yeah. um, and there 
same 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 in in the bay of fundy where they they rerouted ships well uh perhaps that that study that uh Dave mentioned with the tagging will help with some of yes. that uh, aggregation. Yeah. I see uh, Dan and 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 Laura uh, Laura both have their hands up, so we'll we'll turn to to Dan and then Laura, please. Yeah, I just comment along the lines of some things I already said. Is speed is about the only speed reduction is the only thing that's really going to work because there isn't much known about this whale. It's only recently been identified as a separate species, and <clears throat> it's. When you have a really sparsely distributed animal, it means trying to figure out how to study it becomes difficult when it's distributed over a large area and there aren't many of them. So it's challenging. I, I don't even know if we know where they feed. I mean, they're, where they're, if there are aggregations and acoustics will only work if the animals are, are vocalizing. And so we don't know what proportion of the population would be vocalizing. And I think there's even arguments as to there's very few data on the on the, the vocalizations of these guys, if I remember right. So it's a it's a tough problem. And so I salute your attempts to even address this because it's uh it's challenging, but it's it's good that you're moving in that direction. Oh, I and I put some there's there's been a lot of work on the on the West Coast. The advantage we have here is we have much more knowledge of the migratory patterns predominantly from tracking data using satellite tags. Uh, so we have a good idea what what humpback whales and what blue whales are doing. And it's much easier to create uh, vessel traffic corridors because we can much more uh, easily identify where the whales are, are known to occur and adjust the shipping lanes accordingly. But, but again, the primary thing that they've done in most cases for almost every region is is slowing down vessels in the areas where whales are known to occur but again you got to know where they are to to do that yeah the distribution information is very limited and there's no information on if for instance they're going between the east and the west or if they're just two different spots there yeah i mean just also this isn't Taking data from other species and applying it to your area is difficult because given a resident animal in, in the Gulf of Mexico, I don't know, maybe the Mediterranean would be the only other place that, that would have a similar uh, habitat situation. So maybe the Mediterranean might be a good place to see in there. I know there's been a lot of work done on the Med, but whenever you do a north-south current corridor like the, the west coast and east coast, where animals are doing these these very predictable high low latitude migratory paths i don't know how helpful or how relevant our understanding of the migratory patterns of animals that are doing that versus animals in a in a large gulf environment so it again it is challenging thanks for the information on the mediterranean we'll definitely check that out great uh, laura Um, I just wanted to chime in there about the speed thing. That's why I asked that question about encounter versus mortality, because I think we get distracted sometimes about um, that issue, which Scott alluded to obliquely in that um, we assume that vessels that are going slower are okay because they're not going to kill whales, but they can still severely injure whales and they can certainly um, reduce the fecundity, productivity, recovery of that population. So any encounter is a bad encounter. It doesn't matter if that whale survived the encounter, it's still negative. So the idea needs to be keeping whales and ships separate because it doesn't matter if they're going slow, it's still bad. And um, <laughs> whales are still dying all over the place from vessel strikes. It's, we see that on necropsy quite frequently. So um, my, my other question is, um, is there any kind of contingency plan built into the um, this these measures that uh, you guys are uh, looking into for, for this study to, if you find a whale that has been struck by a vessel, do you have a contingency for how um, you will change things 
in the event that what you're doing doesn't work and you need to um, pivot, basically? Uh, I, I'll have to defer to Trey and Haley as well if I, if I misspeak here, but currently there is a reporting. So there is a reporting requirement with the vessel strikes. So if we had uh, strikes occurring, we would be have some kind of adaptive management, of course, that would happen with our consultation with uh, NIMS. So that would be, there would be an adaptive management approach. Um, and we would know if, if they, from that reporting, how often that was occurring um, and, and potentially give us an idea where it's occurring. So we could take that kind of approach as well. Uh, maybe not having to have a broad mitigation measure across the Gulf, but there could be a targeted area that needs to be addressed, um, but it will be adaptive. Thank you. A any other questions from the committee? Yes, Karen. So I, I put it in the chat, um, a, a citation from February 2023 talk, three, three, I think, anyway, talking about acoustic detections of rice as whales in the Gulf of Mexico. It's pretty interesting, it gives some information of you know, of course, they don't all vocalize, but when some of them do, so it might, and it did show some interesting patterns. Thank you. Dave, why don't we have a few? What's that? Dave. Oh, uh, Dave, do you, you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I just want to emphasize again the ability to monitor compliance with anything that you put together. Um, you know, you can have lots of cool policy um, decisions that are just totally ignored. Uh, and we see that over and over in conservation. So I think you really have to make sure that if you put something together, you also included the ability to monitor your compliance uh, or else who knows what, what is actually happening. So that's it. Okay. Anything else, anyone? Any, anyone else have any further comments or suggestions that might help out? Because this is obviously a pretty critical study to and figure out what to do with these whales with only 100 left. Huh? F 51, is that all that's left? Yeah, that's the number I've heard most. 51, most yeah. Hmm. That's rather sobering. Yeah. All right, well, if there's no other, but please uh, feel free to reach out to, to, to Alan, and uh, if you have any other comments or ideas that that might help and and alan of course uh, you're welcome to reach out to anyone on cosa or, or the expert or the the guest uh, experts to 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 further the discussion um if there's no further comments on on this one then we're we're a few minutes ahead of schedule five minutes which is just just right for a friday morning and we so we have a five minute stretch break which now we can have a 10 minute stretch break so Thank you very much, and we'll we'll see you back here at uh, at eleven thirty five. Is it eighteen? Yeah. Ah, well, there we go. All right again, yeah. Oh, there. Okay, everyone, your conversations are being recorded, so. Be careful what you say. <laughs> Great. Welcome back. Welcome back to the, uh, we have uh, one more presentation uh, before we, uh, we adjourn for lunch. And we're turning now from the Gulf to the uh, Alaska Regional Office. Uh, and if, uh, it, is it Sharon who's going to put? Oh, Casey. Okay. Casey, Casey Rowe. Yes. Uh, so we'll turn to you to uh, make the introductions. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can you see my screen right now? I uh, know we, we can see you. Uh, oh. I guess it would help if I shared my screen. This is the first time I'm presenting on on uh, Zoom rather than Teams. Uh, 
Uh, no, still no luck. Still a blue screen there, Casey. We just see a blank desktop. Okay. Oh, there we go. We got it now. There we go. Okay, great. Uh, well, right now I'm actually going through a severe thunderstorm, so I'm gonna cross my fingers that my power and internet both hold out to this. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. I am the uh, chief of the environmental analysis section for the Alaska region out of Continental Shelf Office. I'm sitting in today for Sharon Randall, who is our acting uh, chief of OE, who is now a deputy regional director. Um, so I'm going to give the introduction for her this morning. A um, little bit, just an overview about the Alaska region. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this, but I'll go over it kind of quickly. Um, the Alaska region encompasses 15 planning areas in the Arctic, Barents Sea, and the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, we oversee more than 1 billion acres on the OCS with more than 6,000 miles of shore. Um, much of these areas have no activity, and most of our activity is concentrated in two areas. Uh, for oil and gas activities, we have six active leases in the Beaufort, Beaufort Sea, and then we also have 15 active leases in Cook Inlet. Um, a lot of our science, our Alaska science priorities are, are broken up to about eight categories, not listed in any particular priority order. Uh, but it's many that's similar to what the other regions are, have priorities as well, such as uh, marine mammals, which are important indicators of environmental health. And for Alaska, they hold high cultural, traditional, and nutritional values to the Alaskan Native peoples. Um, Migratory birds are important because we have about 75% of, I believe, seabirds that migrate up through and into Alaska region. Um, they're also important for uh, native peoples as well as subsistence. Uh, fish and invertebrates. Um, a lot of fish and lower trophic level organisms are important for forage for fish, marine mammals, and also for subsistence, subsistence as well. Uh, Bone must understand the physical oceanography of the Alaska region. Uh, some areas such as Cook Inlet are subject to extreme tides and high uh, extreme currents and high tidal fluctuations. Uh, Bone must know about, you know, Ties, currents, et cetera. But up there, we have uh, a lot of issues with ice. So we must understand the timing of freeze up and break up of ice. So we can tie that into oil spill risk analyses, uh, oil spill response plans. And also, ice comes into play when it's designed for offshore infrastructure, whether it's for uh, oil and gas infrastructure or renewable energy infrastructure. Um, climate change is playing a big part up in Alaska. We are warming. Uh, there's different numbers around, but they can be anywhere from two to three or three to four times faster than a global average. And we have been seeing some issues over the past years with uh, warmer waters affecting populations or migration of uh, certain forage fish, and it's having drastic, drastic effects to uh, higher level trophic organisms such as marine birds. Uh, socioeconomics. Uh, we got to understand what is going on with our activities and make sure we're not affecting uh, not only the economy, but also subsistence activities for Alaska Native peoples. Um, we almost we should also we need to also understand cumulative effects as well. Um, we need to understand how bones activities tie in with other effects from other stresses such as state and gas state oil and gas activities. Uh, climate change, avian disease, and forest activities. And then pollutants and... Oops. Did I just skip over? Yeah. Uh, well, pollutants and contaminants are also important, not only for understanding oil spills, uh, but also the effects of greenhouse gases on the Alaska activities. Um, one change that happened recently is in the 2024-2029 oil and gas national program, Alaska was not included with any lease sales for this five-year program. So any activities related to oil and gas in the next five years are going to come from post-lease activities, whether it's exploration or development plans, 
on uh, existing leases in the Boca Sea or Cook Inlet. Um, despite the fact we are in a uh, national program for oil and gas activities, this, this, this does not prevent us from leasing areas for uh, renewable energy activities, which brings us to this subject right here, is our renewable energy potential. Um, in 2023, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory completed a feasibility study for renewable energy potential in Alaska offshore region. Uh, they estimated that there's approximately 3,800 gigawatts of potential energy power from tides, wind, or waves. And unfortunately, a lot of these areas are not really feasible because of the remoteness. They're not close to existing uh, uh, population centers or tie-ins for existing electric uh, facilities. Um, for the Alaska region, offshore wind is, has the greatest potential. Um, and one of the things that the report discovered is that wind energy in Cook Inlet has the greatest potential with as much as 65 gigawatt hours, uh, as, as much as 65 gigawatt hours. Um, also, right now, there's no renewable energy leases in Alaska, and none in Cook Inlet as well. But there are two companies that are interested in uh, leasing areas in Cook Inlet for renewable energy. And I think the end of July, beginning of August, uh, the region is going to go out with a note of a request for information to start the process on. Uh, trying to get some leases up and going for the uh, Alaska region. Uh, one is a side note is that Cook Inlet also has uh, extreme tidal ranges, which makes it uh, possible for tidal energy. And we could possibly get as much as six to 18 gigawatts from tidal energy as well. Um, so uh, the FY25 to 26 uh, study development plan, the Alaska region is proposing five new studies. Uh, the avian corridors and the collision risk with renewable energy infrastructure and Cook Inlet, distribution and abundance of threatened and uh, stellazitis in Cook Inlet, the current seasonal distribution and density of cetaceans in Lower Cook Inlet, the geographical coverage, duration, and type of sea ice in Cook Inlet and also the University of Alaska Coastal Marine Institute uh, program. Uh, for this year, we focused more on Cook Inlet because that's where our future activities are likely to occur. And we're also trying to gear our research up to more renewable energy since this is the information that we need. It's critical that we know at this time. The profile we're gonna discuss today is the avian collision and uh, displacement risk of renewable energy infrastructure for, in Cook Inlet. And the reason why I would like to uh, discuss this profile is to get more information on this because we feel this is the information that is lacking the most for our region is what are the effects of potential wind energy potential on our environment. Um, not sure what the final project design is. Um, it's still being discussed. We need to know what the trade-offs are in value of information, the cost, the logistics, um, and uh, that's why we're here to bring this up, which I think this kind of sets the stage to go over the presentation. Um, one thing I will caveat is I'm not a bird biologist. I'm not a wildlife biologist. Um, Shane Gray couldn't attend this morning, so I'm sitting in for his place, and I will do my best to answer any questions. If not, I may have to defer back to the office. Um, the official title of the study is Assessment and Minimization of Avian Risk, of Avian Collision Displacement Risk Associated with Renewable Energy Infrastructure in Cook Inlet. Look at the background. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, people on this call that are familiar with birds, but I'll kind of Go over kind of quickly. Uh, seabirds are long lived, conspicuous, and feed near the top of the food chain. Um, Alaska supports one of the greatest concentrations of seabirds in North America. 
40 to 50 million, 75% of North American seabirds actually breed in Alaska. Cook Inlet supports approximately 325 seabird colonies and about 500,000 breeding birds. This information is a little bit old. The information is about 20 years old that we have. So last year, one of the studies that was approved was uh, a comprehensive study to update the level of Cook Inlet seabird, seabird colony counts to improve our baseline information. This information is going to be important not only for renewable energy, but for any oil and gas activities that may occur in the Inlet. Cook Inlet also provides winter habitat for the threatened stellar diet. And uh, also the collision or avoidance with wind energy infrastructure is a concern for migratory birds, particularly seabirds and sea ducks. Uh, unlike other activities that we can't that are beyond our control, such as climate change and avian diseases, um, impacts from a wind energy project can be mitigated and minimized if we know the, if the, we know the information of where these flight corridors are. What are bones information needs? The number, location, seasonally use of migratory bird corridors, the number, seasonally use, and types of migratory birds using the corridors across Cook Inlet, whether it's seabirds, sea ducks, or shorebirds. Altitudes used by the migratory birds that fly across Cook Inlet. How well it impacts migratory behaviors. And what are the risks and consequences of collisions or displacement with renewable energy infrastructure? And information from this study to be used to avoid or mitigate impacts from a wind energy project. So what are our objectives? Our objectives of the study. Determine the location and relative importance of migratory corridors and seasonal movements. Describe the number and proximity of migratory corridors and seasonal movements of migratory birds for two sites in Cook Inlet that have the greatest potential of wind energy uh, activities. Uh, one of the results of the ANREL study was that they they discovered that there's two locations that had the greatest potential. Uh, one site is a shallow water site on the eastern side of uh, Augustine Island in Federal Waters, and there's a second site west of the Barren Islands, which is a deep water site in Federal Waters. So the study is also going to concentrate on collecting data down in that area. We'd also like to develop a spatial and temporal model of the migratory bird movements in Cook Inlet to determine the risk and severity of collisions with the offshore wind facilities. And in the end, develop conservation measures to avoid, minimize, and migrate and mitigate impacts to avian migratory corridors. Uh, some of the methods, I'm a little bit fuzzy on this, but I've been a uh, consultant uh, biologist on this. Uh, first step would be to review scientific publications great literature, any data from universities or research institutions to describe the location and seasonal the use of baby migratory corridors in Cook Inlet. Uh, next, we'd like to use that information and then feed into uh, collecting information from the next red uh, radar sites, next generation of radar with, uh, coverage in Cook Inlet. There's three next red sites in Alaska and the region. Uh, one is on the Kenai Peninsula, one is Anchorage, and then one is in Bristol Bay. After we uh, collect that information from the first two parts, uh, they develop maps to try and estimate where the migratory corridors are coming across Cook Inlet. And then the next would be used to, to design some field activities. One would be installing radar equipment to identify the movements near the Barren. Islands and the Augustine Island. Um, and then we use this information to assess the daily movements and migrations to compare with the results described in the literature and the data sets, as well as the uh, weather station radar and the field radar. And one part of the study is also going to be uh, using GPS telemetry of certain bird species and uh, seabirds in Little Cook Inlet to actually uh, try to field identify where some of these migratory routes are. 
Um, what questions do we want to answer? Where are the avian migration corridors in Cook Inlet? What's the relative importance of these migratory corridors, whether it's measured by the amount of seasonal use, frequency of use, and types and numbers of migratory birds? What's the proximity and relative importance of migratory bird corridors in relation to potential sites of renewable wind, wind facilities? And how do diurnal movements and seasonal migrations of seabirds compare to corridors identified by weather and localized radar? And given the study results, what marine spatial planning and conservation measures may be designed and implemented to avoid and decrease risk to collisions with, with or displacement from offshore renewable energy facilities? Um, that area in Lower Cook Inlet around uh, Augustine Island and Barron Island is also used heavily by Stella's Ida's, which are threatened species. Uh, a lot of the area, that area is part of their winter and habitat as well. And we are requesting uh, COSA uh, some, uh, guidance on study design and methods. You know, any suggestions to strengthen the proposed design or methodology are requested and welcome. Um, and then how do we go about analyzing displacement versus collision? Um, we're still early on. A lot of this information can be developed more in a statement of work. Uh, again, I'm not a Navy biologist, but I've been kind of working closely with our biologists on this because I, I feel this is very important for our region because this is one of the information that we most severely lack in this. We have a lot of information that support our oil and gas industry or oil and gas activities, but very little uh, for wind energy projects in the world. And um, I think that is it. If anyone, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions on this. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Thank you very much, Casey. Thank you for the presentation and uh, the the interesting study. We do have uh, three guests uh, that are uh, online here that are 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 we're, we're looking uh, for their their comments and. Um, and questions to to help uh, focus in and guide the proposal. We've got Bill uh, Seidman um, and Autumn Lynn Harrison. Welcome back, Autumn from from yesterday, and Scott uh, Schaefer. So, if we could start with Bill, please. Uh, we'll 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 let you guys go first, and then we'll uh, open it up to the committee as well. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Bill Seidman. I'm the uh, director at the Fairlawn Institute. Uh, it's a nonprofit institution in Northern California. Um, yeah, so Cook Inlet, a uh, very important area for seabirds, as you recognized. Um, the Barren Islands, uh, in particular, are a very important and uh, quite productive, doing well seabird colony. Um, the reason for that is that there is a lot of upwelling uh, in Cook Inlet, which I think, again, everybody knows, um, and it may be possible to sort of get at this concept of uh, migratory corridors, you know, through looking at where the birds are, are feeding, um, and that's related to, to upwelling and the creation of fronts and eddies that concentrate prey. So I think that that's uh, one way to kind of uh, think about think about some of these issues at least um there is uh there's probably a bit of data that could be accessed to do some uh analyses on population sizes uh one comment is the counts on colonies only give you an indication of about half the seabird population uh, about half the population are subadults and immatures or non-breeders, um, and those birds don't come to the colony. So when you do a population count, you know it's only a portion. It's an index. Uh, the data is good, but um, but there's a lot more to the population than just doing a population count on a colony. So um, the North Pacific Pelagic Seabird Database, uh, which BOEM has sponsored um, in the past uh, is a collation of surveys, at-sea surveys, uh, shipboard surveys of seabirds and 
uh, and marine mammals in some cases, uh, and it's it's run by the USGS, um, and certainly that data set could be filtered for you know regions of interest and uh, and analyzed for population trends and population concentrations, for example, where you know where birds are moving, um, and those uh, more migratory corridors that you talked about, Casey. Um, Let's see, what else? Uh, flight altitudes. This is one that people have been asking about in California as well. And I don't really think that data exists. So if that's important, then, uh, sorry, the dog's barking. Um, then uh, that probably is data that needs to be acquired in, in some more directed studies. Um, and I, I guess it is important. So that's something to think about. Uh, certainly, a, a literature review is a good, good way to start. Um, I'll stop there and take any questions if anybody has any any questions, or turn it over to Scott or whoever's going next. Scott, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe we could have a uh, uh, Autumn uh, Autumn Lynn next, please. Everyone, great to see some familiar faces. Um, I'm Autumn Lynn Harrison. I'm a research ecologist at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center and have been deploying tracking devices on Alaskan seabirds and shorebirds for the past 10 years, um, often in partnership with USGS and Fish and Wildlife Service, and also have projects that have been synthesizing data across species. Um, so hopefully we can we can help with this. And my perspective especially is on migratory corridors. Um, I think this is a really important study and, and well described with data available from prior work to support the study. I really appreciated the integration of individual tracking, radar monitoring at sea surveys to get at species specific pathways, um, as well as to assess pure abundance of movement. So I think that's all really great. I'm going to uh, talk about a missing topic that I thought could be included, and then um, describe some, some data and frameworks that are available to support the effort, and then just an interesting point for your consideration, Casey. Um, one topic I thought that could be included fairly easily is um, a topic of connectivity, because for Alaskan breeding populations, there are often differences in pathways and corridors between populations that nest on the North Slope, for example, versus interior nesting seabirds and shorebirds versus Western Alaska. So assessing the origin and destination of those populations will be critical to link any potential impacts back to specific population trends. Um, so I, I really recommend thinking not just about the corridor through the region of Cook Inlet, but those origin and destination locations. And I often receive requests from Pacific Ocean jurisdictions like New Zealand, Australia, Philippines. Um, they host Alaskan species for the bulk of their year, and they're really interested in potential impacts to their wintering populations. So how might displacement or collision affect which countries or US jurisdictions um, have management responsibility over the wintering populations, something that, that could be considered pretty easily, I think. And there are existing data and frameworks to support this. Uh, the Migratory Connectivity Project is in the final stages of completing an atlas of migratory connectivity for the birds of North America. So I've been editing the seabird section, and we have a section on shorebirds. And that includes writing species accounts, detailing the state of knowledge of what's known about their movements and connectivity. It includes the full bird banding lab record, contributed tracking data, um, study summaries when the data weren't contributed to the Atlas. It's gonna be a hard volume book, but we also include kernel density maps for, for seabirds in that area. So. We, we completed a full literature review up till the end of 2021. And we have that database of what telemetry data exists for, for seabirds and shorebirds. So that was systematic and could be updated um, pretty simply with just 2022 to 2024 studies. So that's a lot of work I hope that would already have been done uh, to support this. 
So I'll add a, a publication in the chat as well that just gives an overview of, of the tracking data that was discovered through this process and, and a gap analysis. Um, yeah, and so having seen all these species by species maps for seabirds and shorebirds in the area and, and written the accounts, I think some interesting points are that the patterns often seem to be that shorebirds tend to cross perpendicular to the direction of the inlet. So from, from Northwest to Southeast, while seabirds often travel the length of the inlet um, parallel to the direction of its geography. So they're, they kind of cross each other during the migratory periods. Um, it's not always the case, but that's kind of a general pattern. So that's gonna be an interesting um, conundrum in, in terms of, of the crossing movements and, and collision risks. So just something to highlight there. Uh, and that is it for me. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Wonderful, Autumn. Thank you. And and now we'll we'll, we'll turn to Scott, please. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending on your time zone. My name is Scott Schaefer. I'm professor of biology at San Jose State University, and um, I've been involved in a number of tracking studies uh, over many years, both in Alaska and California. And, uh, down in the southern hemisphere. Um, I think it's already been said that this is a very timely study and a, and a very important one. Um, I think it's timely from the perspective of uh, the ability to apply tracking technology to many of these species that are small. Um, we've now got uh, tracking tags that will um, can be carried by a number of these uh, species. I would suggest that that whoever does the the research seriously consider the different species or the range of species if they're going to use telemetry, because uh, the ranges over which many of these species are going to travel is going to vary dramatically depending on the species. Petrels will go much further. Uh, Kittywakes not so far. Uh, well, actually, they'll go far, but not as far as the petrels. And um, the alcids or ox won't go as far as the kittiwakes. Um, so there is some limitations there in terms of, of uh, what you'll get. Building off of something that uh, Bill had said about the population sizes, uh, it's true that you won't have the, the non-breeders uh, at the colonies, but what you have to understand, too, is the fact that the breeding populations will uh, essentially double and maybe even triple in some cases for different species because of the offspring that are going to be fledging from those nests. And those birds could be uh, subjected to uh, influences from the turbines. Um, Something else that I think is important to consider for uh, any kind of modeling effort is uh, to potentially, and this could be put together with tracking information, but is to incorporate at least some basic parameters of the ocean oceanography in the areas, because that's really what's going to be driving where the birds are going. And, uh, and so if they're, at least during the breeding season with the telemetry data, if the birds are all going to certain places uh, based on the oceanography, that might inform uh, the interactions and or the pathways in or around the uh, wind turbines. Um, what else? There was something else. Oh, um, one thing that I would also encourage your group to consider is once you have telemetry data um, to evaluate home ranges and or um, specific high use areas uh, of the habitats that they use. And that could be done by, you know, various resampling methods to sort of encompass how many birds you would have to uh, track in order to understand whether you've captured the home ranges and the the movement patterns and habitat use of those birds. And there's a number of studies that have done that kind of analysis, whether it's been marine mammals or or seabirds and um, 
that could be found in the literature and or you know checking with a number of us uh, for some of those references. Um, I'll go ahead and pass on for now. I may come back with a, another follow-up question, but um, I'll pass it off to, to Bill or Bob Millen or anybody else. Great, thank you, Scott. Thanks very much. I, I'll, I'll open it up to the uh, the COSA uh, committee for anyone to, to comment. And and uh, I, I'd like to actually start off myself, if I could. I, I thought it was a very interesting study, uh, Casey. And I, I do want to um, like compliment the uh, you know the the author with their their fifth question because I thought the fifth fifth question about um, you know considering uh, you know these findings and 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 the spatial planning and conservation measures how can the design uh, and and uh, be implemented to avoid that you could almost take that question and put it in any other proposals that the last is an objective that's you know we really like to see that for for all of them um i've spent a little time in in, in cook inlet my, my, myself and uh I was thinking for this study particularly, especially where you're looking for the data sets, I would think that that, that taking a little time to talk to the the the, the tribal communities and the fishermen about um, bird migrations and the traditional knowledge on bird migration might be particularly uh, uh, relevant because they they probably have a pretty good idea of at least uh, some of the some of the corridors there. And the other group that you wouldn't normally think about but in in cook inlet it might be particularly relevant would be the water water plane pilots there's a lot of people have airplanes up there the water planes they get around all the time with it they use it in the herring fishery and they might have an idea on the height of that those birds travel they'd always be aware of that so it's kind of a I, it was always something i was struck at is how many people had water planes and how 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 much so just a perhaps a little off the off the off the cuff but uh maybe something to think about um jeremy go ahead yeah uh thank you so uh, just first following up on uh what was just said i, I would add birders to to the list uh and and then certainly out of port of homer there's a lot of uh uh tourist traffic uh on you know three four hour cruises and so there's got to be a lot of sort of good local knowledge in uh lower coat inlet um uh, one thing that i think is going to be really important is to get the overlay of of shipping because um it, i i just sort of pulled up a, a map and it looks like you know uh, you, you talked about St. Augustine Island or Barron Islands and all around Barron Islands, there's, there's just ships. Uh, so it's not going to probably be a place where we're going to site wind turbines. Uh, so getting that understanding, I think you can really narrow the field. Or, you know, and basically it looks like south of Williamsport uh, and then sort of east of uh, where you can continue on uh, south of Lower Cook Inlet uh that are those are you know the east there's just a lot of there's tug traffic there's tanker traffic there's passenger traffic uh and we're just not going to probably site wind turbines there so you know you can probably narrow your field of study uh on the issue of timeliness i mean this is a great interesting scientific study i guess my question is is there any noise out there that uh alaska has any interest in the near term of developing offshore wind so it ties back to sort of like the the regulatory connection between the studies program and uh what you you guys are trying to do uh otherwise so um thank you yeah uh, just to answer a couple of questions uh we do have a, a good shipping study that was finalized around 2020 it looks all different types of, of uh shipping activity up and through cook inlet so we do have that data um as far as timeliness uh we're getting ready to go out with a notice of information the end of this month uh, our region is pushing hard with those couple groups that are interested to see you know, if it's really going to come to fruition or not um the last thing about as far as citing the annual report only looked at 
what the areas that were had the best chance or the best uh, conditions for wind energy projects. They didn't look at bird habitat, whale habitat, anything like that. Um, I'm pushing hard to start with some uh, public outreach, not only for activities such as this, but for fishing activities and you know, recreational activities as well, because we need to know what information is. Um, we know where the best wind sources are, but when the projects come in, it's a long period where you have to go through, you know, besides NEPA and analysis and pre-planning, uh, it's also site selection. So, you know, we know where the best sites are for wind. Are they really going to be exactly those spots? Possibly not. But we need this data to help site those locations as well. Um, you know, when I first saw where those two locations are, I'm like, yeah, that's going to be interesting with all the, the bird activity that's going on down there. And, you know, being heavily on the NEPA side most of my career, I know that we have to go through early on and trying to help uh, any applicants select the sites which are going to be least impactful as possible. I mean, everything has an impact, but our goal is to make it as least impactful uh, as possible. And, you know, knowing this information will help us site the, those locations when they uh, actually come into us. Great, thank you. Any anyone else? Any other thought? Oh, I see someone. Has a, oh, Dan's got his hand up online. Go ahead, Dan. Can't resist. Um, I, just really comments. Everybody covered the material well, and just uh, the first thing is num the the issue of relating the ocean condition, oceanography with the seabirds. I think that's critical, and also a shout out to the seabird community is really the group that led that kind of fundamental research and relating habitats of the animals with the oceanography. And, and so again, that's fundamental. And it's completely off the wall question for Casey. I was involved in OXEP years ago, and there was a lot of discussion of uh, uh, lease, lease sites like St. George Basin and Norton Sound. And from, from your presentation, it's clear that not much has changed in terms, and I'm not arguing it should, I'm delighted that those other places didn't get leased because there's a lot of amazing critters out there. I, I don't know if there's a real answer, but it's surprising to me that so little of the potential OCS uh, areas have been leased, or is it just a lack of interest, lack of, of uh, feasibility? Are I we talking? It, was an, it was an off the wall question, but I, I couldn't help. No, that's why. Are we talking for oil and gas activities? Yeah, oil and gas. That's the the long running uh, historic. Um, uh, one thing is, you know, cost. Everything's more expensive in Alaska, um, and then a, a lot of it's distance to infrastructure. Uh, as far as the Arctic, uh, those areas do have some areas they can tie in on the North Slope to transport oil oil down here to to where it could be, you know, uh, shipped out. Um, there's a lot of state activity that's going on in Cook Inlet. Um, I think there's either 16 or 20, maybe, uh, oil and gas wells in state waters, and those those uh, reservoirs are being depleted. Um, there still is a, a fair amount of uh, resources that are untapped in OCS waters, but if they just haven't gotten to it because you know the expense and the distance from infrastructure. Um, we keep hearing from Hillcore, which is the owner of those 16, 15 leases, that they plan on coming in with an exploration plan within within the next year or two. Um, when they drill the next well in state waters, they plan on using that same well to file for an exploration plan to drill in federal waters. And the natural gas reservoirs that are being tapped out in the state are running low, and they use so much natural gas for electricity and uh, heating in the whole Cook Inlet, you know, Kenai Peninsula, South Central area of Alaska, that uh, they're going to have to do something. So um, we'll see. We keep expecting an, an exploration plan any day, any day now. It just hasn't quite happened yet, but we're expecting it within the next year or so. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. I, I've, I've wondered about that. Thanks. Uh, Scott, you had a question, a uh, comment? Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention, too, that, um, you know, when your call or, or or how you, you know, who, who you're soliciting for, for this 
um, to do this work. Um, something that's important to consider, and this is, I think, unique to birds, is the fact that you've got um, both direct and indirect effects from the wind turbines because you have direct effects from an actual impact or collision with between the turbines and the birds. And then you also have uh, indirect effects where the birds might increase their travel times through these corridors just simply to avoid going around or going through these um, turbine fields. And those could both have impacts on at least breeding birds. Um, so these are just some of the things that, you know, should go into, um, uh, and then the other thing, and, I, and I'm sure this is, will probably come up is, um, how you might assign an impact score based on the, the sensitivity of the, the species that's under consideration, for example, whether it's an ESA listed species or, or, uh, a more common species whether it's a migrant or uh, a breeding individual, because those things will all have different impacts uh, potentially on population levels. All right, thank you very much. Um, is there any other comments or thoughts on this proposal? If not i it's a little time for uh us to break for lunch so thank you very much to the guests for their thoughtful comments and time and uh casey i hope that helps the proposal move forward no it's uh it's very helpful we appreciate all the input that we can get uh, i also dropped my email address in the uh, chat box in case anybody uh, has any follow-up questions wonderful thank you thank you all right We'll uh, and everyone will see everyone back here at at one fifteen. Thanks a lot. Thank you. There we go. Welcome back, everyone. This is uh, the the last afternoon of our our COSA meeting, and uh, we're gonna jump right in with the marine minerals program and and jeffrey you're gonna introduce it is that correct uh that's correct awesome yeah, kevin awesome well if, if we're all all set um then please great yeah, i just have a, a few slides uh so bear with me um jeff reidenauer i'm the chief of the marine minerals division at bohm and the division's part of the office of strategic resources and the, the program, we're part of a, the overall marine minerals program in the Bureau. So we're a relatively small program within the Bureau. We have about mm, uh, 22 people now. We're just hiring a new data scientist uh, in the next month, which is really super exciting. Uh, so we have 15, 16 people now in the division, in headquarters, and six people in the Gulf of Mexico. But we're a small but growing program. Uh, I do want to Thank everybody for attending the uh, Marine Mineral Focus uh, session that we had back, I think it was in April, right? Yeah, just recently. So we greatly appreciated your participation in that and all the comments we got back from you on uh, all the work we're doing. Because uh, uh, like I said, we're a small program, but we're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of work uh, in both uh, sand resources, uh, sediment, and also critical minerals. So greatly appreciated your your time uh, in uh, Irvine. Uh, next slide. So the program, uh, we're the environmental stewards of marine minerals uh, on the outer continental shelf. Uh, this primarily is uh, sediment for beach nourishment and coastal restoration projects. And uh, the information that we gain from the environmental studies program is super important for all the work we do with respect to uh, 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 exploration and extraction of minerals from the outer continental shelf. Uh, the bulk of our work is providing sediment uh, uh, for those projects. And one of the projects is shown on the lower left there, just a recent project in Brevard County, Florida. 
that uh, Brevard County is on the uh, east coast of Florida, central coast of Florida. Uh, Florida is a, a pretty big consumer of uh, outer continental shelf sand. Uh, we've been proactively preparing uh, what we call a national offshore sand inventory. So we've been we've been expending program funding, not uh, environmental studies program money uh, to develop this uh, inventory. So we are identifying where sand resources may be located for communities to use. So proactively going out and identifying those resources. But that's really super important also to deconflict uh, potential uh, other uses of the sand uh, uh, of the seafloor, such as uh, offshore uh, wind farm transmission cables that'll be sited uh, onshore. So we don't want them cutting through important sand resources and taking those uh, resources out of uh, potential use. And then, <clears throat> like I mentioned, uh, a large part of our port growing part of our portfolio is offshore critical minerals. And we've been uh, doing some fundamental work in terms of uh, identifying potential locations of cr critical mineral bearing deposits on the outer continental shelf. And then also doing some fundamental uh, environmental uh, baseline data collection as part of that. And in terms of offshore critical minerals, uh, I'd say all of our projects are leveraged with other federal agencies, especially NOAA and USGS. Uh, like Rodney had mentioned yesterday, we don't have boats, we don't have ROVs, we don't have those uh, um, uh, technologies within the Bureau. So we like to leverage those uh, with NOAA. And then USGS has some special uh, uh, SMEs to help us, uh, you know, with our work. So we leverage uh, the other agencies. Uh, next slide. So we have some fundamental uh, information needs as a program. These uh, information needs inform our NEPA documents, our environmental, I mean, our endangered species consultation documents. So our basic fundamental information needs include uh, understanding the impacts and recovery from, from dredging sand offshore. Uh, and this includes uh, in particular, the benthic and fisheries communities, but also potential impacts to protected species such as uh, sea turtles. Second information need is understanding the practical implications of long practice uh, mitigation for dredging. Then uh, we've been developing information and tools to support, as I mentioned, multi-use uh, conflict uh, evaluations. And then um, collecting just basic environmental data on uh, critical mineral uh, deposits, and then taking that information and uh, essentially looking uh, and assessing potential impacts from uh, uh, exploration and development. This is certainly in its infancy, although I will say that the um, international uh, activity uh, outside national jurisdictions, there's been a lot of uh, work done in, uh, for example, the Pacific, uh, looking at the potential impacts from uh, mining and exploration activities in the international waters. Uh, next slide. So we have eight study profiles, uh, marine mineral profiles that is that are in the uh, studies development plan for this year. One of which is entitled "Protected Small Tooth Sawfish Occurrence in Bohm's OCS Sand Resource Areas." Um, this is going to be presented by Dina Hansen, but she was supported by two other colleagues in the Marine Minerals Program, uh, Doug Piekowski and Victoria Brady. Uh, the objective of this profile is to characterize the occurrence and movement of small tooth sawfish near sand re resources on Florida's Atlantic OCS uh, to better understand any uh, correlating environmental factors and how uh, our authorized activities may affect this uh, critically endangered species and its habitat. Now, Florida is, 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 is as I mentioned, the uh, largest uh, consumer of uh, uh, OCS sand. We've issued more leases and agreements in Florida than any other state, uh, and that's continuing to grow. We have a number of active projects in Florida, and we have a number of uh, uh, projects that are in the pre-leasing stage. So it's a very active state in terms of uh, 
uh, beach nourishment and coastal restoration, I think for obvious reasons, you know. So uh, this is a, this is, is an important profile for us and uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Dina, but there's been some um, recent um, uh, deaths uh, uh, with small tooth saw sawfish in Florida. So it's a kind of a timely profile too. So I'll just hand it over to Dina. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and I will share my screen um, and hopefully get this going like so many of the other. There we go. I think you're seeing the right screen now. Is that correct? Yep, thanks. thanks. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Jeff, um, kind of teeing this up. It's great to see familiar faces that I got to meet in April at our MMP focused meeting in Irvine. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there in person today. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, I do have co-authors on this profile. Doug Piekowski and Victoria Brady will be joining us um, for the discussion uh, session. So I told them they are not off the hook just because I'm the one presenting this um, right now. <laughs> so let's jump right in. If you are not familiar with um, small, tooth small tooth sawfish, then um, I'm excited to be the first one to introduce you to one of the coolest fish in the sea. Um, so you can see this picture of them in the top, uh, well, it's on my right. I'm not sure if it's right or left for you, but in the top corner, um, that is a photo of the small tooth sawfish. It is related to rays and sharks as an elasmobranch. Um, it does have this very cool rostrum that protrudes and has um, small teeth on both sides of it, um, hence that sawfish name. Um, they can live up to 30 years, which is pretty old for fish, and they can get um, up to five meters long, which is also pretty big for fish. Um, so this uh, species, unfortunately, though, has been listed as endangered um, under the Endangered Species Act since 2003. Their species-specific recovery plan does identify habitat loss as one of the threats to the population's recovery. Um, they used to range from Texas to North Carolina, but you can see in this um, map that is from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, their range has been severely constricted to Southwest Florida. Within this distribution, there has been critical habitat, which is a designation under the Endangered Species Act. Um, it's been designated in coastal areas, um, mostly for juveniles. And so um, shorelines, especially with red mangroves and with specific freshwater flow regimes have been deemed critical habitat for juvenile small tooth sawfish. For adult small tooth sawfish, there has not been enough information in order to identify their critical habitat. So we're still figuring out where they aggregate, where they reproduce, mate and pup. So that's kind of an important component to keep in mind as we um, proceed. So because of this map and this known current distribution, we were quite surprised when they showed up at a, um, a an acoustic telemetry array that is BOEM funded, that's on the east coast of Florida near Cape Canaveral. So we were even more surprised when it wasn't just an, a, one single anomaly, but we had fif over 15,000 pings and, over, uh, and 22 individuals that occurred at this array. One of them returned six years in a row. And so this led us to think that there is, is much more going on here than what we you know, previously thought um, and so this, uh, this array was established over eight years ago uh, for other purposes. We were, BOEM was funding a tagging effort of bony fishes, sharks, and oceanic manta rays. Um, and so because this array uh, has been deployed for several years, we naturally pick up fish that have been tagged by other researchers. And this included the endangered small tooth sawfish. So knowing that the small tooth sawfish occur at Cape Canaveral is purely opportunistic up to this point. But understanding their full distribution is critical to identifying habitat requirements and therefore um, impacts from BOEM authorized activities, especially in light of a current die off. So um, more than 50 small tooth sawfish 
have been confirmed dead uh, with more likely that are unrecorded. And this is centered around the Florida Keys, started happening last fall in um, 2023. Mm -hmm. In the last couple weeks, uh, one another death was confirmed as far north as Tampa Bay. I'm gonna show you a clip. So small tooth sawfish are not the only fish that is afflicted. There have been more than 40 species that have been documented showing this behavior. But you can see in this video, the animals are circling, rostrums often out of the water, and then they often beach and die. So this has um, been puzzling researchers for quite a while. Uh, we have state, federal, academic researchers working tirelessly, um, testing tissue samples, water quality samples, even taking a fish um, back to a lab for recovery. But the cause of this um, bizarre behavior and ultimate death is still unknown. So even though we know that habitat loss was a threat to the population's recovery, now that we're faced with this unprecedented and devastating die off, um, the urgency is even higher to realize what are the important components of habitat so that we can therefore conserve and ha conserve habitat and help the species in its recovery. So getting to our BOEM information need, as I mentioned before, opportunistic detections of this protected species is providing new insight into their distribution. They are not purely in Southwest Florida, but rather we're seeing a number of them use the Florida Atlantic coast. Um, as you can see, this figure on the right um, is at Cape Canaveral. This is the array that, like I said, BOEM has funded for multiple years. So this gives you an idea of the distribution of the sawfish that have been detected. Um, over 15,000 pings from 22 individuals um, in this area. This is an active um, marine minerals leasing area where um, kind of in the middle of where those uh, pings are, there is a historic lease area that has been dredged multiple times. There's also a potential new borrow area just north of that um, that could be coming online um, in the near future. Based on the environmental data and observations, dredging is unlikely to directly entrain small tooth sawfish. So rather we're focused on indirect effects to the species. So therefore we need more information on how these um, dredge and lease areas might support small tooth sawfish. We know that dredging removes um, benthic infauna for three to six months, but the benthic community composition can be affected for um, up to several years. Um, dredging also removes sand and could change the shape of the seafloor, um, which can also affect hydrodynamics and currents. Learning how these components contribute to small tooth sawfish habitat will help us understand the effects of BOEM authorized dredging. So our objective, as um, Jeff already mentioned, is to characterize the occurrence and movement of small tooth sawfish in existing and potential sand resources on Florida's Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf to better understand correlating environmental factors and how BOEM authorized activities may affect this endangered species and its habitat. Um, we've had many studies that have been, had had great success with a phased approach. So this is what we um, are proposing for this study. Um, the first phase would be to um, have a more robust analysis of the existing telemetry data um, around OCS sand resources, specifically for Florida's Atlantic coast, um, supplement with fishery dependent and fishery independent surveys. Um, as well as interviews with researchers, fishermen, and other stakeholders. The phase two approach, um, which would, we, you know, we envision having a field component, would use all the information from phase one to help inform methods, scope, effort, um, and cost for an actual um, kind of field, uh, uh, field um, campaign. So going to our research questions, um, again, another map from um, our east coast of Florida to give you another idea of context of where we're talking about. This is 
at Cape Canaveral and um, the very charismatic small tooth sawfish mm -hmm. on the bottom there. Um, so we want to, what we're asking is how do small tooth sawfish spatially and temporally overlap with OCS sand resources on Florida's Atlantic coast? And what environmental factors correlate with their occurrence? In the face of a high mortality event that introduces uncertainty in the population's recovery, the expansion of small tooth sawfish and their occurrence on Florida's Atlantic coast should be examined now more than ever. So with that, we do have a couple questions that we've teed up um, to, for discussion, but I would like to pause here and invite, um, um, certainly Doug and Victoria um, are online if they want to um, kind of join me on camera, but also um, for the committee and our invited guests to um, start the discussion off. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, Dana, thank you for the presentation. It is great to see you. And and, and thanks to your colleagues there for uh, for helping uh, put together this. We we do have a couple of uh, uh, guests that we've invited to, to, to help us with this, to comment on it. Um, uh, Bob... Uh, I am per, pardon me if I'm not pronouncing pronouncing your last name correctly, uh, uh, Herto, and um, also Andy Sykes, uh, if if they're there. Um, we'll, usually, what we do is let the the guests kind of lead off with some comments and and questions, and then open it up to the committee. So, uh, so Bob, if you'd like to start, please. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Very well. Uh, thank you. You were close. It's huter like rhymes with computer. So, so there you have it. <laughs> uh, my name is Bob Huter, and I uh, I have been an elasmobranch researcher for fifty years, more than fifty years, uh, primarily sharks, but also uh, some on rays, which includes the sawfish. I'm very happy to see Bohm looking at an elasmobranch species. Um, it's a breath of fresh air, quite frankly, and. Uh, sawfish, um, and Dina, you did a great job to summarize the, the whole, the, the scope of the issue. Sawfish are probably the most endangered group of vertebrates in the world. There's about five species, and as Dina said, the small tooth sawfish used to be distributed from uh, North Carolina all the way to Brazil. Uh, so throughout the Gulf of Mexico and the, and the east coast um, of, southeast coast of the U.S., um, it was it was put on the ESA in 2003. Um, a lot, most of the, the 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 groundwork was done actually in in my laboratory at Moat Marine Lab at that time by Colin Simfendorfer and Tanya Wiley. Uh, Tanya is still very active in this in this realm. Colin went back to Australia, but Tanya is here and she's she's a very important expert. She should, she really should be quite frankly in this panel, but instead of me, but, um, and, uh, since 2003, try to get slow rebuilding, slow recovery of this species. Uh, it's hard to say how many, but several thousand, maybe, um, the fact that there, these animals are getting picked up, uh, in the array at, at Canaveral is, is not particularly surprising. Uh, they were, they've been known pretty solidly, at least as far north as Jupiter and Jensen Beach, and Canaveral is just a, a stretch north of that. Uh, that. Hopefully they have been recovering and rebuilding, plus there have been many more efforts to put uh, acoustic as well as satellite tags out on these animals, so the, so the research has expanded. Um, but as Dina pointed out, we've just gone through a horrendous um, UME, unusual mortality event, where probably at least 100 of these animals have have died from that uh, whirling disease. And that's a pretty bad hit to a population that's that's only got maybe a, a couple thousand animals. Um, so one of my questions is, um, how how much have you in, in putting this plan together? How much have you coordinated or consulted with NOAA's sawfish recovery team? Because they are the one federal agency that has really been focused on this particular species and um, 
For example, a lot of in, in phase one of, of this proposed study, this is already ongoing by members of that team and, and related academics. Uh, telemetry data are already being analyzed by a group at Florida State University, for example, uh, by Tanya's group with her consulting uh, firm. So rather than uh, reinvent the wheel, I would, I would certainly encourage you to, to, to work with them and see what they've already, what they've already accomplished. And by the way, the, the acoustic arrays, for those of you not familiar with acoustic arrays, um, it, they're not isolated just to this one bone funded site, but we have acoustic arrays all throughout the East Coast, of the US, the FACT array, and in the Gulf, uh, an array called ITAG. And there's a lot, there's probably a lot more sawfish, well, I know there's a lot more sawfish data in, uh, from those arrays than just that, that one. So that's, that's um, I guess that's my main question is, is what's, what's happening in terms of coordination with NOAA? Uh, what are the plans to try to take advantage of uh, groups that are already well ahead on these questions? And, um, and who do you, who do you uh, anticipate working with for phase two if you, if you move into uh, a tagging situation? Because as you know, as an endangered species on the ESA list, you have to have a permit and they're not easy to get, believe me. <laughs> so, um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to, to Dina. Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, I think what we um, are balancing at this point is that this, uh, the profile stage is not funded. It's, you know, and we're uh, somewhat low on the list as far as potential for funding. So, and with our budget environment, it's very competitive. Um, so we wanna have these conversations without sort of um, promising too much or, um, you know, letting researchers know we're interested in these questions, but it's not yet funded. Um, so we have um, actually Dr. Dean Grubbs has, is invited. I think he's on today um, from Florida State. He's one of the main researchers tagging sawfish out there. Um, probably a lot of fish that we picked up in our array were his. Um, we also have are going to be meeting with um, Ad Dr. Adam Brain from NOAA leading the sawfish recovery team. Um, we're meeting with him next week. He was invited, but not unavailable for today. So we are um, having the starting those conversations. Um, I, I think we're yeah we're kind of balancing the that we're so early on in in our kind of internal BOEM process that we we want to talk with people but we just don't have any fundings to back up um, those discussions quite yet. Um, I, I totally agree that we don't want to reinvent the wheel, um, especially because the tags that we picked up in that array, even though the array is BOEM funded, the tags are not BOEM tags. So we're very limited, you know, with what we can do with them. And that's part of what this idea behind phase one would be is to try to sort of find those researchers, work with them um, to, to use what they already are analyzing, but add that lens of sand dredging um, to say sort of like, can we pull out these specific areas that are targeted for dredging and see how that fits into that big picture. Um, and I think from our study team with Doug and Victoria, we've talked about that we don't wanna to be too enmeshed in our little postage stamp of dredging and miss um, the context that is driving their distribution or some of those more important habitat questions um, that are related. So that's something that we've, we're, you know, we're kind of talking through and, and we want, um, to meet BOEM's mission as well as the recovery mission, which every federal agency has um, is required to do. And we are we're very aware of the permit issues. We have several um, ESA studies that have, yes, <laughs> we. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> well, you have to deal with it all the time. That's perfect. You know, perfect. Uh, you you mentioned Dean Grubbs and Adam Brame. Those are the, you know the top people you should be talking with. So I hope personally, I hope you do get the funding for this. This one, <laughs> would, I'll write a letter or do anything I can. And I'm Thanks. sure Dean Dean would love to be part of that uh, part of that study because he's uh, he's his group is um, the most expert in this species here in Florida. Thank you. Great, uh, Andy. How, how about you? What, what what are your thoughts on the proposal and any suggestions? 
Hey, I'm Andy Seitz, and just for some background about me, uh, I live up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, I am not a sawfish expert, but I do. I conduct a lot of research, um, many of which projects are BOEM funded up here on fish movement and fish movement analyses and overlap with human activities. And I've done that on dozens of species up here. Um, I, I am familiar with, I've conducted field research in Florida with some of Dean's collaborators, Dr. Grubb's collaborators, and I'm familiar with sawfish and, and recent issues that they're facing now. Um, and uh, so from, from less of a sawfish centric and more of a sort of understanding overlap centric uh, viewpoint, um, I, I think the, the approach is sound of, of collating existing information first, and that should that should enable you to uh, to try and find some data gaps um, that need to be addressed. Um, I would, and and if you get to the point of funding and and moving into uh, actually deploying more tags, I'd encourage you to use a, a multi tag approach. I think, um, and that can be on individual animals such as double tagging or putting one tag on on different animals and, and the, the tags that come to mind are are um, satellite tags and uh, acoustic tags like have already been mentioned. Um, and uh, and and I recommend that because they they provide highly different but highly complementary data types um, in terms of in terms of uh, uh, resolution both temporally and spatially. Um, and the information that they provide um, uh, in terms of different environmental sensors. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's important. Uh, one of my one of the things that really comes to mind is rather and and I don't know how <laughs> how challenging this is logistically, um, but rather than tagging sawfish, or, or in addition to tagging sawfish elsewhere and hoping they show up in Canaveral sands, try and target sawfish that are on Canaveral sands, and that might provide some some complementary information that's already been produced with with pre-existing tags. Um, and then um, trying to understand fine scale movement patterns on Canaveral sands. I, I don't know what data exist and don't exist, and how many receivers there are, but um, with a well-placed receiver array, there can be some really, really good analyses uh, that, that focus on fine scale movement patterns in relatively localized geographic areas. And mm -hmm. I'd recommend doing those. Um, and then so, and, and then sort of expanding on that, thinking about uh, what are the environmental correlates of sawfish occurrence in the area. Um, and that can be done a variety of ways. Um, but um, and and each one has its pros and cons. There's no right or wrong way to to think about that. But I'd I would um, uh, I recommend thinking about those. And then that can be used. Um, you know, it might be simple. It might be depth based, for example. And so maybe sawfish prefer some certain depth. And then you know, if if you're trying to develop mitigation plans for for reducing overlap with human activities, um, you know, trying to or getting a, a a basic understanding of what is what are the correlates of sawfish occurrence um, that information can be used with with uh, uh, mitigation plans. And so those can I are, those, follow up yeah. and ask you know what do you, um because since we are we obviously want to know I mean we're kind of dealing with basic information here the there's just so much um, that we're still learning about especially adults which you know we believe that's most likely the the life stage that's out at Canaveral Shoals based on distance from shore and depth. Um, should we also be looking at like a diet type study, trophic ecology, um, especially thinking from like a dredge impact effect, um, if we're removing their, you know, the, the most direct effect from dredging is the removal of benthic in fauna and kind of a disruption to the base of a food web. Um, so we, we aren't expecting to necessarily directly entrain small tooth sawfish, that doesn't mean that turbidity or other, um, you know, current changes might affect, you know, affect them too. But that was one of the things we're trying to think of as well. Yeah, I, I think that sounds like a good idea. I don't know the logistics of 
collecting diet information on sawfish. I don't know if they're amenable to things like gastric lavage, which is basically shoving a hose in their mouth and blowing their stomach contents out. I don't know if people have done that. So I'd defer to the experts on that. Um, and then one of the important things would be, you know, rather than just understanding or, or, or solely understanding what's in a sawfish stomach, it would also be important to conduct complementary surveys on what's available in the area to see if sawfish are focusing on certain prey types um, and, and thinking about whether, whether they're selecting diet items or whether they're opportunistically grabbing diet items from the seafloor as they encounter them. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think, I, I think those are both good, good ideas for moving forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. We've got a couple of, couple of questions from the, the committee as well. Uh, uh, Dina, we'll start off with a, uh, Katrin, and then I see, uh, um, uh, Dan has his hand up and, uh, yeah, so go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, Katrin, I can also University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, but uh, I'm not a fish biologist, so I was just curious about uh, something. So you identify the array around Cape Canaveral, but then Bob mentioned that there are other arrays as well, and it seems uh, prudent to you you know use every available resource out there. So I was just wondering, are there also any arrays out on the uh, golf side uh, where you identified the juvenile um, habitat? So and if they are, it seems that would be useful to include to get a broader and from a different environment um, um, data from different environments to maybe create a more solid habitat association. Um, understanding, you know, again, just using all the data that are out there. Um, and um, sorry, I thought I had another question, but I forgot it now. So anyway, it was just, um, I think you mentioned in your question, should we expand sort of the target area? And I, I guess my answer to that would be, I would I would do that and, and get as much information as possible. Yeah, the, the bulk of... Um, telemetry work has been done on the Gulf side of Florida. Um, I think that's why we have that, you know, a better picture, but that's just where sort of the hot spots are, have been located. Um, so that's definitely something that we, we were curious about kind of that recommendation of integrating Gulf and Atlantic coasts. Um, and I think that's something that we could talk to the NOAA recovery team, who's probably doing those type of analyses at that scale. And then maybe we could kind of link in, um, cause of course we have, borrow area, lease areas on the Gulf side as well. Sorry, and, and I guess that's, um, uh, I understood you to say that we basically don't have much information of where they occur on the, uh, um, on the uh, Gulf side that we know for the juveniles, but not so much for the adults. But if that's wrong, then disregard my comment. No, you're no, you're right. It, the the bulk of the telemetry work has been done on the Gulf, ma mainly um, in juveniles. They're easier to catch um, versus adults. But I think as the juveniles have been tagged and are maturing, that now we're starting to get this better picture of what adults are doing. But it's it's just the very beginnings. Um, but yeah, the the sort of folk focus has been historically on the Gulf side. Um, I know there is a tagging effort very close to Canaveral Shoals in the Indian River Lagoon. So it's sort of tapping into those ongoing efforts to see how can we um, either just, you know, grab on to, like, you know, kind of piggyback on them or leverage kind of similar methods, maybe in a different geographic footprint. Right, thanks. Well, I'm sorry. Before we go to Dan, Bob, did you do you want to comment on, on this? topic or this question yeah <clears throat> just a couple of things real quick first um on the, the the question of their trophic ecology and what they're feeding on i think that would be great to incorporate into this work um from the standpoint of how how modification of the habitat affects their their food base and um andy i agree with everything andy said by the way andy was great and andy mentioned gastric lavage that's probably pretty tough. Uh, I don't know if how much of, of it's been successful with sawfish, but, um, and you can do stable isotopes, you can do fatty acid analysis, but that tends to tell you where in the food web they're, they're feeding, not so much species. But fecal DNA, 
has, has really come along and you can you can take um, feces samples and then evaluate you know analyze the DNA and, and tell exactly what they're eating that way so, so that's something to think about doing and as far as um, the other tags uh, satellite tags th these animals are, are not good candidates for what are called spot tags which are real-time tags sort of kind of like a GPS kind of a thing but they are good candidates for pop-up um, satellite tags. The problem with both pop-up satellite tags and acoustic tags is they're not real time in, in most cases. Now you can get uh, real time um, acoustic receivers that are on buoys uh, that they're expensive, but they, they essentially call in when they, when they get a ping. And something you might consider is uh, um, as this thing moves forward is requiring uh, receivers to be posted in areas like maybe I think it's already done now that I think of it, but we have receivers out in areas that are being dredged and real time receivers, not the traditional ones have to be downloaded and you get the data later. Um, because then then you could pick up the presence of sawfish maybe before impacts occur and the last thing i'll say real quick is I heard you say something about you didn't think that dredging I think the term used was entrained sawfish which. It's kind of code for kills them <laughs> directly. Um, I'm not so sure about that. I, I wouldn't be so quick to conclude that because uh, the, one of the bigger sources of fishing mortality for sawfish are, are trawls. Mm -hmm. And you would think that, yeah, these are mobile animals and they're big and they can, they can move with you know, some speed. So, but they don't always avoid trawls if they can't avoid trawls, maybe they can't avoid dredges at times, and, and maybe they do get impacted directly by the by the dredge. Yeah, I think during um, this phase one, where we're kind of doing a review, we would look at historic because um, dredges do have protected sp species observers on board to monitor intake screens to look for parts of animals, um, and so that's how we can document takes of sea turtles or sturgeon. Um, and just historically from, but that's something we need to do a, a more robust thorough um, look at the data to be sure. Um, but just off kind of anecdotally, they aren't as, they don't see, they don't seem to be showing up the way that other animals are. So, but that is something that we do need to look at um, carefully. Great, hey, thank you. So we'll turn to Dan and I do want to give a uh... Uh, uh, Dr. Dean Grubb, a, a chance to comment too. I believe he's online if he uh, if he would like to. Um, so so Dan, we'll go to you, and then and maybe have uh, Dean uh, um, say a few words. Yeah, a quick comments because almost everything I was going to say was just said. Um, I wanted to say that the the comment in the, early on that we they didn't know the animals were there. It's just another example of how tracking when you put a tag and you ask an animal where it goes, letting the animal tell you. You learn things that you wouldn't have known otherwise. So it's just a another check off example of tracking is amazing. Uh, also, the Andy and and Bob ta talked about localized tracking, and and that's really different than the the kind of array that exists. And these are where you can actually you move follow the movements of individual animals. That would be a phenomenal study if you could do that in the area where that you're actually doing the. Uh, the dredging, and if you could, again, the if you could catch animals to put the tags on, that would be incredibly informative. You get real-time, fine-scaled movement patterns. Uh, and then the trophic ecology, I put in some papers. There's a ton of papers using stable isotopes to infer uh, trophic ecology. It's not just, you, depending upon the prey field, you can start to get sometimes, whether it's squid or fish, or invertebrates, there's it's it's a blunt instrument, but it's a phenomenal, phenomenally easy tool to use. Uh, I've done a lot of stable, I've done a lot of fatty acid analysis, and it's a nightmare. It's very difficult to do well, uh, and yet in both cases you need a, a prey library. But uh, and eDNA, the fecal DNA is another interesting approach. But the trophic ecology before and after would be excellent. And then the other thing is, there's if there are all these dead animals, that's an opportunity to take tissue samples, and I suspect people are already doing it for stable isotopes. So take advantage of these critters that unfortunately have died 
and even if there are other places, I, I'm not a shark person. I don't know what's known about the, the trophic ecology of these guys, but those would be great opportunities to start to get some more information. But again, all the comments that were just said are right on target. So I agree with uh, our guests. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And uh, Dean, please. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, I'm actually sitting outside of a uh, conference room at the uh, American Elasmerink Society meeting right now, a society that both Bob and I have been past presidents of. And so uh, there's a couple of sawfish talks going on as I speak, <laughs> and another one coming up in about 20 minutes about the mortality event. But um, yeah, so we, uh, as far as the trophic ecology, I'll say what we do know is we know that they're fish eaters all the way through their ontogeny. They almost solely eat uh, fishes. Um, and we have done at least a little bit of the, we published one paper about five years ago using a combination of stable isotopes and fecal DNA uh, for our juveniles through adults to look at, at what they were feeding on. And, but that was all done down in Southwest Florida, obviously. And so it would be good. I, I think the idea of trying to catch them and tag them there off Canaveral in that region is critical. We've known that for some time. Um, we published a couple of papers. My former student, Jasmine Graham, was lead on them a few years ago um, that highlighted Cape Canaveral as um, an important area for adults because we had both uh, adult males and and females um, using that area three of the four seasons, basically. Um, and we have them all going as far north as, as Charleston, South Carolina so far. Um, and as, as far as the panhandle of Florida, but, but Canaveral seems to be the only area, you know, north of South Florida where they, they, they tend to spend quite a bit of time. They stay there. You know, we, I think we have my, my student, Ashley Doughty just presented her, her, uh, some analyses yesterday here at the meeting, uh, analyzing the data from about 80 adult sawfish that we've tagged down in South Florida uh, and their movements and Canaveral's definitely showing up as an important area for that and them. And uh, so we've been trying to figure out a way to, to tag sawfish in that region for, for some time. We did uh, our first trip to Canaveral just about three or four weeks ago uh, to try to, to tag sawfish. We unfortunately didn't catch any on that trip, but I think we can with a little bit more effort. So that's just to say, I don't want to take too long to just say we are doing a lot of this. We're analyzing I think Ashley said we we you know Bob mentioned the receiver arrays. Uh, our sawfish have been detected on um, uh, over 1,100 receivers um, up and down the east and the west coast of Florida. Uh, so they're they're moving around quite a quite a bit, but they do spend a lot of time in the Canaveral area. Um, and to Andy's point, one of the uh, one of the papers that Jasmine um, published, we actually combined satellite tagging with acoustic telemetry on adult sawfish with the idea of looking at overlap with um, commercial fishing uh, gears. Um, uh, to, uh, but there's no reason why we couldn't redo that analysis specific to the, the dredge areas too. So, but thanks, thanks again. And I, I think Dean and I are going to have a meeting uh, next week. So. Yeah. Thanks for making time for us today. I know you're in the middle of a conference. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we're we're kind of uh just just over time, uh, Denine. So we'll uh we'll sign off there unless there's any more comments or questions. But uh, it's great study. I really hope it goes forward. Uh, it sounds like it's a really important one, and you get a great group of collaborators there too. So, and really lovely to see you again. Thanks. Yeah, you too, Kevin. Yeah. Great. Uh, if it's all right with uh, everyone, I know we're supposed to have a stretch break here. Uh, but maybe um, if you need to stretch, just mm -hmm. pop up and stretch. And we'll just say uh, we're in the three point crouch to, to towards the end of the meeting. So why don't we move right into uh, uh, the first in class uh, project and program uh, programmatic assessment for enhancement, uh, enhancing uh, BOEM's uh, public <clears throat> participation practices. So uh, Rodney, I'm not sure who is going to present for you guys on that. Megan, okay. Yeah, yeah. Megan should be there. There she is. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we hear you great. Hello, hello to conference room and everybody online. Um, so just, just I have my slides pulled up and can I think I have permission to share my screen or um, 
if there was another process that everybody was doing, then if somebody has not the slides pulled up, just let me know. Uh, you can go ahead and share your slides if you want to. Sure. If okay. that's easy for you. Yeah. Just um, bear with me for one moment. Okay. Okay. Looks great. See? Okay, great. Um, I'll just give me one more moment here to get my notes. Um, Oops. We see your notes now. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, yeah. So, hi, everybody. Thank you for um, letting us take some time in the meeting to um, present to you on this program evaluation study, which is um, not actually on the study's development plan, um, but which BOEM is progressing as an Office of Environmental Programs Operational Initiative. Um, I'm Megan Cornelison. I'm a social scientist with the Office of Environmental Programs. I'm presenting today with Laura Mansfield, another social scientist. Um, however, several of us in OEP developed this proposal based on discussions with staff across the Bureau. Um, just a little bit of kind of base setting. We are actually currently finalizing a scope of work for um, the program evaluation, which you'll hear about today. Um, but we're presenting here to um, hear your thoughts on possible, um, well, anything we can incorporate, um, you know, um, into the scope of work, which we're finalizing, but also looking a little bit further, bigger picture to possible next stages of this broader effort. All right. <clears throat> so um, we're using public, we're using the phrase public participation here to refer to a range of ways in which BOEM reaches out to and engages with stakeholders and the public to communicate and receive information or input during BOEM's decision-making processes. Of course, as an agency tasked with managing public resources, public participation is vital to almost everything we do. And, you know, BOEM is well aware of the importance of public participation in meeting the Bureau's mission. Um, one example is it's reflected in the 2024 to 2028 uh, strategic framework in which uh, the Bureau identifies an operation priority to develop strategies to enhance transparency of BOEM's decision making processes and facilitate inclusive engagement with ocean users, partners and key stakeholders. Um, as you're likely aware, I mean, as I'm sure you've, you've been hearing about, you know, BOEM's geographic and program related responsibilities are growing, such as expanding into the US territories and establishing an offshore carbon storage program um, and others. And these new responsibilities mean, of course, that we have an opportunity and a need to focus on establishing and maintaining trust in BOEM's processes. And then, you know, our, our more established programs also require public participation to meet obligations, such as under NEPA and other planning processes. Um, because public participation is a critical part of um, BOEM's processes, it's a ripe area for developing a programmatic assessment or evaluation and identifying evidence-based approaches to focus on for enhancing um, practices moving forward. This would help provide kind of systematic process processes and plans for public participation and share institutional knowledges of, knowledge of best practices, lessons learned, and common stakeholder concerns. There we go. Okay, so this project meets um, several interrelated information needs. Um, BOEM would benefit from consistent and effective approaches to public participation that are based on scientifically backed uh, good practices. Um, it also arose through a lot of staff to staff um, cross program and region cross you know, multi region discussions, um, in which staff has kind of just been talking and expressed um, a desire for processes and tools and resources that can be available to apply consistently across the Bureau. Um, there's also recognition that we could do a better job capturing knowledge, both kind of institutional knowledge of staff and, and what we've done. Um, and information shared by stakeholders and the public. Um, we recognize that there's a lot we can learn from what we've already done. Um, we've been conducting outreach and engagement since BOEM's inception, and of course our predecessor agency also had responsibilities in this realm. 
um, and we received feedback from the public and others on those processes. So for this project, we're kind of focused on what we're saying, looking backward in order to look forward, um, to learn from our history and from BOEM staff so we can be better prepared to develop kind of evidence-based um, strategies to enhance our public participation practices um, and also inform a potential study on the science of engagement. This um, project intersects with helping to meet other requirements and environmental program goals. The Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2018, better known as the Evidence Act, um, includes requirements for agencies to plan to develop um, statistical evidence to support policymaking. And this would utilize evidence gathered through the program assessment to support BOEM's planning processes and ultimately support policy. Um, additionally, the full vision of this work, uh, by which I mean this program evaluation plus envisioned future related efforts, um, and, and advances BOEM's aspirations in conducting an environmental program that is first in class, um, including meeting some of the attributes of a first in class environmental program identified in the letter report prepared uh, for BOEM by the National Academies. Um, I'm sure lots of the COSA folks here are somewhat familiar with this report. It's been a um, you know, high priority of the, um, environmental, a high environmental program pri priority at BOEM for a number of years. Um, the uh, citation for the report is available here. For folks who do want more information, I invite you to dig in. Um, I'm not going to spend um, a lot of time today reviewing the report, but just briefly, um, you know, it identifies 18 attributes of what would be considered a first-in-class environmental program, categorized into five kind of broad groups of cross-cutting process, outputs, impacts, and innovation. Um, and then, you know, a number of kind of um, descriptive attributes that fit into those categories. This project touches on a number of attributes identified in the report, some of which are listed here. Um, such as articulating the sphere of influence and collaborating effectively, encouraging tailored products, informing public understanding and adapting to challenges and innovation in innovating. <clears throat> right. Whoops. Jumped ahead. Hold on one second. There you go. Oh, goodness. Sorry. Sorry, my um, slides are being very sensitive right now. <laughs> there we go. Um, so as I've kind of alluded, we don't, we're not proposing this as a single project or that this would get us all the way to where we want to be. So we're kind of breaking this effort into pieces to, you know, of course, partially to availability of funding and to allow, um, you know, parts to build upon one another. So within that framework, these are the immediate and long-term objectives which support the broader vision of enhancing BOEM's public participation uh, processes um, to increase public confidence in BOEM's decision-making. Um, so for this phase, like I said, we're primarily um, focused on the objective here to evaluate and learn from our history and support initial strategy development and identify future information needs. Um, this would enhance BOEM's understanding of the strengths and areas of improvement of historical and current um, public participation practices um, rooted in a systematic, systematic review process. Um, so these other kind of longer term objectives, you know, the study would help us make initial progress on these and would kind of set us up to move forward on them more fully. Um, so these would include informing our understanding of key priorities to improve effectiveness, uh, consistency, and outcome of BOEM's public participation efforts. Um, so these could be kind of longer term, larger scale advancements we could focus on. Um, identifying a set of metrics that can be implemented for all public participation activities to help, um, help us measure effectiveness and also denote further science needs as they relate to public participation. Um, and then evaluate BOEM's um, public participation tools and recommended tailored products and resources um, needed to increase effective participation. So with that background, um, I'll hand it over to Laura to talk through this specific um, project in more detail. 
Thanks, Megan. Hi, everyone. Um, so next slide, Megan, if you can. Yeah. Um, thanks. So to help meet the first objective, Megan was talking about that, you know, near term, looking back at our history, and then to start contributing to the other ones, this project would have three main deliverables. The first would be an organized database of materials related to public participation. So this database would include things like internal guidance materials, meeting notes, scoping reports, um, you know, synthesis of comments on past NEPA documents, um, things like that. And, and gathering this all in one place would make it a lot easier for BOEM staff to access um, past processes, find examples of what was done before, and really have an area where that historical knowledge can, can be kept over time. Um, just a place for us all to refer to when planning new, new public participation efforts. But also the, you know, this effort is going to need to have all of that organized to do the second deliverable, which would be a summary report um, that is the program evaluation um, element of, of this project. Um, and that program evaluation and a report of, of the evaluation will look at the strengths and areas of improvement um, for the public participation element of BOEM's activities. Um, it would look at uh, helping to identify the sphere of influence, um, including opportunities to partner and collaborate with other agencies um, or groups. And then it would look at also external challenges to, um, to effective and meaningful public participation processes. The third deliverable would be a next steps plan um, that, that provides BOEM with an outline of existing um, public participation processes and, and initial tools and resources, um, as well as prioritized actions that BOEM should consider um, to, to start to implement implement to improve our public participation efforts. And that would include any future information needs or scientific studies on engagement. Next slide. So we included our the driving research questions here. And I'll note that, that some of these are overarching going beyond this uh, initial phase. So the first two questions here, are really focused on the first phase of, of looking back at the history. And then the last three are more overarching for the future. Um, but further work will be needed to fully answer um, those final three questions there. So in short, it's, you know, what can BOEM learn from over a decade of public outreach and engagement? What have we done well? What's been challenging? Um, are there specific topics that keep coming up in public comments about our engagement processes? Um, how can BOEM improve upon and standardize public participation practices? Um, how can BOEM reduce stakeholder fatigue? For example, can we use um, institutional knowledge as a pre-scoping tool um, to better share what we've heard before across programs and projects? Um, how can BOEM be identifying and leveraging joint engagement opportunities with federal agencies like DOE or NOAA and state agencies that they handle other parts of uh, offshore energy processes? Um, what long-term or large-scale advancements to public participation can BOEM consider to achieve the priorities in our strategic framework? Um, all right, so next slide. So a little bit on the methods are overall, you know, this project is a retrospective review of, um, of public participation. We're targeting the last 10 to 15 years um, with input from internal staff through interviews and, and surveys um, to identify potential lessons or trends or good practices. Uh, we feel it's important to include temporal depth in this study that's looking back at least 10 years, um, maybe 15, to capture information from earlier forms of 
outreach and, and engagement, especially in light of changes in meeting format during the pandemic and ongoing today. So we'd like to be able to see changes in engagement approaches over time based on different, um, different things happening in the world or with BOEM's decisions. Um, so the first step um, in this project will be to get all those materials together. Um, BOEM expects to be able to provide a, a majority of these relevant materials uh, related to a range of types of past experience. So not everything we've ever done in terms of public participate, participation, but a good, um, a good selection that has uh, processes that are across time periods, across programs and formats. Um, step two and three there um, are about, um, the next step would be to synthesize and analyze um, public comments about BOEM's public participation process from this range of materials. And then that synthesis and analysis um, we'll be using content analysis software, AI tools, or other appropriate tools to analyze the comments and identify key themes and trends. And then the fourth step would be to collect internal information from staff through interviews. We're thinking both um, interviews with individuals who have a lot of experience in public participation, and then also group interviews. Um, that so we can get a, like a, a wide range of people with experience on different projects. Um, and this internal information collection effort would be used to provide context to better understand the common analysis done in the previous step. Um, and then it would inform the program evaluation. Um, and then step five would be to have the contractor with the lens of the comment analysis and internal reviews create a list of potential solutions um, for what we're hearing through the program evaluation as um, areas to focus on. Um, so we're, we're hoping they can think through processes, tools, best practices, that, uh, and develop an initial list of potential solutions that BOEM could explore more deeply in the future to address the limitations and barriers identified through the interviews and content analysis. Next slide. So for some of the outcomes we're, um, we're aiming for is that this would, uh, the program evaluation would position BOEM to develop and propose an externally focused social science study on public participation to help us advance on those longer term objectives, um, that it would help BOEM meet program assessment requirements related to the Evidence Act, that it would support BOEM's aspirations in conducting an environmental program that's first in class. And overarching, the main driving outcome is to, um, is for this historic look and the future efforts is to position BOEM to enhance and improve its public participation processes and ultimately increase public confidence in BOEM's decision making. Um, next slide. So just to remind you what Megan mentioned earlier, we are in the final stages of, of putting the statement of work together um, for this initial program evaluation effort. So we're, you know, we're, we are limited in the amount of changes we can make at this time, um, but we are, really welcoming um, input on specific tools or, or ways the methods might be um, honed a bit to, to make it more successful. Um, and then we're really especially interested in more substantive um, feedback on the next phases that we've yet to really design or think through um, how we're gonna you know, really utilize this program evaluation and start deciding priority areas to work on and, and further information um, or plans we need to do to, to really actionize what we're learning in the program evaluation phase. Um, and we are, we're also really welcoming ideas on, you know, the specifics of this program evaluation, you know, those tools, 
um, to do the content analysis of the comments, ideas on key themes and search terms that we definitely want to include, and any advice on contacts um, that we should engage with during this process or future efforts. And with that, thanks so much. And we're really looking forward to your thoughts. I'll just mention also um, the other folks who have really uh, been on this team helping Kristen Strelick and Stephanie Webb are on the call as well. And so they can jump in. Please jump in, Stephanie and Kristen, as well for the conversation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, <clears throat> a really uh, interesting overview. Uh, I'm going to open it up to the committee, and I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, that Carrie, uh, one of our former uh, um, COSA members, is online, and uh, one of our social scientists, so she might want to uh, uh, comment as well, and we will welcome her uh, her input too. So, um, anyone have any comments off the bat? Uh, Kevin. Hi, this is Kevin St. Martin. Thanks for the presentation, really appreciate it. Um, I just had a number of uh, kind of quick thoughts. I'm not sure what order they're in, they're a little random, but just some ideas. Um, uh, the first thing is is the, um, the idea of participation um, kind of so far, and I know I'm sure you thought of this, but it, so far it seems like one thing in a lot of ways. And, and I think we know that it can range dramatically from something very, uh, you know, from an interview that's highly extractive of knowledge to the co-production of knowledge to something that's actually transformative of knowledge production, right? Like there's a whole range of ways that participation can be understood and thought about. So maybe like some kind of typology of what those modes of participation and their goals are could be really useful to help frame, frame this. Um, you know, like, oh, here's the here's the four ways on a continuum that we can think of participation um, and the goals of an interview that's just extracting information is very different than participatory action research, which is about participation that's meant to be transformative of local uh, things, right? Like, so, you know, that kind of typology might be, might be really useful uh, when thinking about participation, especially in this retrospective way. So interesting, right? To kind of evaluate what participation has been and you know then seeing like well which into which of those bins does it fall like that might be a really useful uh practice uh as part of this um and sort of related to that i am very interested in uh how participation uh has been thought of at boehm or how, how it could be thought of as precisely transformative of how knowledge is produced, right? Like there's often a, you know, participation doesn't have to be about knowledge transformation. It can be just about like, oh, filling the gaps in what we know about sharks. Um, and we're gonna ask people versus, you know, um, participation as a way to transform how we produce knowledge from different epistemological perspectives or different understandings of nature or different just experiential um, knowledge production, right, as, as part of it, and doing a more kind of a cope, the goal of the participation being more co-production of knowledge or, right, like, I'm, I'm very interested in, in that question. And I think that that's, um, might be something to foreground in this research and in this retrospective, especially insofar as you could perhaps link it to how Boehm has or has not addressed questions of equity and environmental justice, which are often associated with questions of knowledge co-production and who's included in participatory actions and who's excluded from participatory actions. Um, have, you know, that there's a relationship there between, an, uh, I'm just thinking a retrospective on participation could be an interesting way to also think about um, what has led to uh, marginalizations in who's involved and who's reached out to and who's considered a stakeholder and who's not and so on and so forth. Like this, uh, there's a relationship there that might be really productive in here. Um, let me just look at my notes, sorry, uh, real quick. 
yeah those are the those are the, i suppose the the key things i would i would ask you to think about yeah great uh dan you, you. have your hand raised yeah you know, kevin and i were both on the kevin stokesbury and i were both on the first in class uh report and the, just a few comments from being on that committee you guys touched on this the co-creation of knowledge and stakeholders was really something that uh was very important you you've already recognized that you've you've touched on things that i think are really relevant St stakeholder fatigue and i've you know a lot of us it's always there's a tendency to go to the same group or same people and then the the last thing i was going to say is having been involved in some really high profile controversial projects we'll put it that way there's always this thing about somebody at the last minute comes up how come i never heard of this and so what really is is crucial and i don't know how you do this is how do you reach the right people how do you reach the most appropriate people you're never going to reach everybody and there's always going to be somebody that finds out about it when you're about in the final phase of things and and then feels like they were left out i know i've been in, like i said involved in a project where the prime player was giving presentations all over the place and when that question was leveled at, at the individual they were surprised they said well i don't know what else i could have done but it also speaks to our limited sphere of our own experience. And so figuring out how to reach the people that really need to be engaged is, is critical. And again, I, I think you guys are aware of that. And I think that was in your presentation. I just wanted to, to just say that I agree that's really important. Thanks. Karen? I don't actually have much to say, but I do like the idea that you're going to think about stakeholder fatigue because that's certainly something I wrestle with because there's a great need and I don't know what the word is, edict, yeah, whatever, to to do, to communicate science just to, to stakeholder communities, but sometimes they just get overwhelmed. And so where I was trying to figure out how can we do this effectively and in a way that, that would be serve the need but yet not drive people crazy and so <laughs> i'd be really interested to see what you come up with because <laughs> i'm looking for it too i i've got a, a, a comment about the thing because we think about trying you know we do a fair bit of uh outreach with uh working with our our different you know fishing communities and that type of thing and uh what one of the things that you guys might want to think about when you're looking back at your at, at the, the 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 staff and the people that have been involved is maybe and, and i'm not I'm not sure how you for lack of a better word categorize people but i uh, you know i was always taking when i when i uh, read um one of gladwell's books about you know the idea of connectors and you know how how ideas spread and and you know maybe i, I know it's it's a it's kind of a fun read, but maybe take a look at that too, because you might find that, you know, it w you you interview a hundred and twenty year staff, and and you know everyone on average talks to maybe five people or something, but one person communicates with one hundred and fifty or two hundred people, and I, I've always I, that's something we we've been trying to do at at our lab and institute is try and find those people that are the connectors and that can really kind of spread spread the idea, and if you can get one of those in the right position for you know your social science output or your, your 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 social media that that makes a big difference so i i i know that's what we do and you might want to think about that when you're interviewing your and, and, and thinking about your you know because some people just by nature are, are not very good at at reaching out to the public and that kind of thing kevin i i, I hope you're going to agree with me not turn me down <laughs> I may be a bit scattered like Kevin, a lot of, a lot of thoughts. And I'm really glad that you guys are are, are undertaking this. Um, one thing that initially wasn't clear to me was whether this was going to be an externally led program evaluation or internally led. And, and that makes a huge difference, I think, as to the the results. And I, I 
I mean, uh, maybe you don't have the budget, but I would encourage you to try to find the budget to do find someone external to to lead this program evaluation. Um, the literature review, you know, I think is going to be you know really critical too. Uh, I mean, we we know a lot about public participation going back to you know Arnstein's ladder of participation in you know the mid '60s and. Uh, uh, Dietz and Stearns did, uh, you know, magnum opus, uh, for the Academy back in, in 2008, uh, on public participation in, in environmental matters. Um, so we, we, we do know, uh, a, f a fair bit, uh, obviously the, the program evaluation literature is going to be sort of critical too. Um, one thing that I also didn't hear I, that there was going to be interviews and focus groups of staff, which I think is good, but I didn't hear anything about interviews and focus groups of people external to BOEM. Uh, and they're going to have different perspectives uh, on issues of participation. Uh, and, you know, we, we've done surveys uh, about offshore people's views of participation in offshore wind. We're just now writing up results uh, on uh, 37 interviews we did on, uh, on uh, various aspects of justice. So uh, recognition, uh, procedural and distributive justice, and how, how community members are thinking about these, these issues. Uh, and I think you may get a different perspective uh, from them. Uh, there's also a lot of focus on stakeholders, and I really hate that term uh, because most people are not stakeholders. They're, they're just people who live in communities, or you know, they're 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 you know, and you know, a, a lot of them you might be able to go and touch base with it, you know, the American Legion or Veterans of Foreign War or Kiwanis Club or, you know, or, you know, there are just people who live in these communities uh, who are not part of these organized groups that are the usual suspects of stakeholders. Uh, and we don't really think about them. They're, they're part of the non-recognized -recog groups. Uh, they're, they're, they're not marginalized communities who, who, who Kevin rightly pointed out are often we, we, we tend to lose their voices as well. Um, so I, I, I also would heartily agree with the issue of stakeholder fatigue that that's that I think that's clearly in the commercial fishing, uh, amongst commercial fishers. Uh, but related to that is capacity. Uh, and I don't just mean there, there's both intellectual capacity um, and and knowledge capacity. So you know, one of the I, many moons ago, I worked for the federal government in the in the Superfund program. Uh, and one of the nice things about the Superfund program is that there was dedicated monies for communities that had Superfund sites that they could go and access, and then they could basically hope hire their own experts to advise them uh, and to help them through the process. Um, so there's there's the intellectual capacity, but like with commercial fishers, there's a time capacity as well. Uh, and, and, and just even for everyday people, we need to be thinking about, when we're talking about participation, people have different capacities at different times of day uh, in order to participate. Um, so all these things are, are, are you know, I, I think are quite important uh, as you're thinking about uh, how do we engage it. And I, I would agree that, you know, we need to think about participation um, broadly, and it can be from, uh, you know, Department, I don't know how much BOEM does it, but Department of Energy puts out uh, requests for assistance on, infra, you know, they put out RFIs uh, where they say, tell us how, what you think, how we should design studies. 
this kind of study. Uh, and they get a bunch of you know knowledge in. So that's one way to bring in uh, knowledge. Uh, there's, you know, obviously there's there's co-management. Um, there, you know, and we can go even further, you know, from the the Native American tribes perspective, they like land back. Uh, but uh, you know, I think in the oceans, um, you know, the tribes are looking for some sort of degree of co-management um, and, you know, very much are troubled by the notion of consultation, um, don't really like the term consultation. Um, we need to at least move towards engagement. Um, so, you know, words matter uh, and, and how you approach things matter. Um, anyway, I'll I'll leave it at that. But anyway, I'm really really happy that that this is going to be a sort of uh, next step and a priority of of, of Baum. Kevin, thanks again. Just uh, just a quick comment, thinking about this question of fatigue, um, you know, for participation, and I I think you know. Um, you know, one way around that is quite simply to pay people to participate. Uh, and, you know, and I don't mean to be facetious. It's like, think about, you know, your, your salary and your postdoc salary and whoever else is doing the interviews. And then you're asking this fisherman to give you three hours of their time. Like, what is that worth? Um, it's worth a lot, you know? Uh, so that's just puts it on the table. But I think the, the other way to think about the fatigue question is really, uh, to kind of get back again to maybe in the retrospective, it would be so interesting to see how were people approached and what was the understanding of what they were doing with you? Were, were you inviting them to produce knowledge with you? Mm -hmm. Were you simply simply interviewing them and they didn't know where the information was going? Were, were you, um, you know, asking them to really be involved over the long term, solving a environmental problem like those are those are going to have really different fatigue results you know one is one which is my experience has been the degree to which they feel like they're co-producing knowledge with you is the degree to which they're not fatigued they're like i am an expert like you and you have acknowledged i'm an expert um and together we're going to solve a problem the fatigue question often doesn't come up in that case right but when you're just like can you help me go through these 200 questions i'm asking 50 fishermen this they're not interested like that's a different so the this idea of the type of participation its goal and uh it, and so on is really related in a lot of ways to the fatigue question which is to say it's our responsibility to communicate what we're doing and what we want from people um so i'd ask you to i think in the retrospective to look at was any of that conveyed? What was the goal here? Um, how was their follow up with this person over time and they were involved in a larger knowledge production process or not? Like the retrospective could really look at that. That would be so interesting. Um, yeah, and of course asking if you paid anybody or not would be interesting. Uh, I can... I actually make another uh, comment too, and I, I don't know if you're how you guys are are um, going to categorize it, but if uh, if there's some way to figure out if the the stakeholders if their their advice was was listened to and acted upon, which I think is what what Kevin's talking about, because I know in our experience with the um, with the with the fishing industry and the wind farm uh situation and it actually wasn't a boom uh decision it was a coast guard decision about that grid pattern but you know uh the, the fishermen provided you know they went to meetings they provided a lot of information talking about um what they could and couldn't transit safely and and, and fish into and then uh for for the coast guard to come out and say well one nautical mile is fine and not give them any transit lines or anything you know I, I i often equate it to you know having a having a professional plumber come in and say well you need a two inch pipe for that drain and then i decide well no i just i need a one inch pipe you know it's it's like you the the these you know the fishermen anywhere are, are, are 
professionals. I trust them to take my students out on the water. And so, you know, we, we treat them like, you know, if a captain says we can't go, we, we don't go, you know? Uh, so I think that, it, it, and what happens is, is that if they're not listened to, what, you know, it's like you can say, I love you a th- hundred times and say, I hate you once and I hate you is what everyone remembers, you know? So you, you, there, there's some kind of the positive, negative feedback and it's not, not equal. I, I don't know. I mean, I know that's just kind of layman's terms. It's not really my, my area, but that's some of my experience with that. I know, I know. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. That was, um, that's lots of great feedback. We really appreciate that. Um, I will just clarify to, to Jeremy's point um, about um, getting feedback from folks external to BOEM. That is one of the items that we kind of have already, you know, we've pinged for um, a next phase. Um, so we're have, you know, we, we, kind of have a limited budget right now for this one and, and a limited amount of time to put it together. And we wanted to have this portion be internally focused, but we're definitely not hoping not to stop there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And uh, I don't yeah. know who last spoke, but the, but as you were talking about the, you know, did the loop get closed with people who, who we worked with? How, you know, I was thinking through like, was there a follow-up? How's the relationship after that, you know, was trust lost in that process? I think those are all really good things that we can work into the retrospective evaluation of like um, things to look look for. So I'm, I'm kind of encouraging, is there anything along those lines? Did that trigger any ideas for others of things we should be looking for consistently across processes, indicators um, to be evaluating them. If any other indicators are coming to mind for other folks, we'd love to hear them. Anyone off the bat? I mean, I, I had- Pretty soon I can probably share with you uh, a survey instrument um, that goes into a a lot of detail on uh, justice aspects. So there's a lot on process and um, which which might be helpful. Um, And we can probably share interview guides too. That'd be really helpful. Thank you, Jeremy. A bit of a random thought, if that's okay. Sure. Just going forward, the the, the work of um, uh, Sarah Watmore in the UK, she's a geographer, and her and a few other folk did a study now, it's quite some time ago, but they really took seriously this question of controversial environmental issues and stakeholder engagement and knowledge production, and really tried to think of a model of engagement that got away from the problems of the expert and the stakeholder and this whole dynamic that kind of emerges from that sort of participation. And they they came up with a model called competency groups um, where expertise is kind of leveled across a range of people who come together, uh, some of which might be scientists and some of which are not. And the and it, uh, the, the goal is to create a group competency about a problem. Uh, it's a really interesting model. I, I'm, I mean, it's not going to help you with this retrospective at all, but in terms of looking forward, like how, what could participation look like um, in an institutional setting, it, they've had quite some successes with it in, in terms of, in that case, I think it was water management primarily, but it, it was a controversial environmental issue. Um, which seems to be what we're mostly talking about these days. So uh, you might want to check that out. I can I can send references. Great, thank you. Hey. 
Sorry, you want to highlight a few? Let's see. Well, so I just wanted to make sure everybody saw Carrie's comments in the chat because it looks like she had to leave, and and I think she supports a lot of the conversation that that we've been having so far. That was all. How are you when when you once you do this review and and you you get the um, get the different opinions of, uh, when you move forward to the next phase, what are you what are you thinking of doing with it? I can start yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we do want to do that external, um, getting the external perspectives. I think that's top of mind. We want to talk to. Um, we do want to talk to the a lot of federal agencies that work with us and go through these consultation processes um, along with us. And then of course, you know, talking, I think talking to, to states, a lot of the folks we work with in like, you know, the, um, the task forces and the folks that are regularly already engaged with BOEM, I think would, would be really good to interview. Um, and then I think moving to folks that, you know, don't engage with BOEM and, and figuring out, you know, why and what could improve that improve that level of participation as well is where we we're going um and then you know internally we really want to think we put in this you know an initial list of solutions that, but internally i think we're going to be working on developing a strategy moving forward um, that has kind of um looked at this evaluation and does some more more research and and starts to pursue the solutions and tools um, and puts it into like a, a strategy altogether. Um, Megan and Kristen, anything to add there? I don't think so. I think that that's a good summary of kind of what we're thinking for next steps. Um, it also will, you know, I think be one of those things that might evolve a little bit over time based on the <laughs> initial mm -hmm. phase. So, yeah, yeah, we're, we're very anxious or curious to see what we learn in the early phases, both internally and externally. And one of the things that we're asking for is to start a conversation of how we can improve the science and how we can look at some of these um, newer ones that that you're bringing up and some other things and how we can. In, in a you know contribute in that area as well not just improve internally but also try to contribute to the body of knowledge so one of you were asking about uh, metrics and how uh you know how to measure your success of communication one one other question when you're when you're talking to your 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 people you might want to um ask you know and what kind of medium did they use to to communicate for for example if i really want to get fishermen to to talk i don't give them a powerpoint i put a map down on a, a on a table and say show me where this is or or that is that that's what you know gets them talking and stuff and i know that in some of the early meetings that we had with boehm when we were first talking about the wind farms no one had no there was no maps and and so we were kind of talking at cross purposes for, for the fishing industry because they're very you know they're very visual that way i don't know if you guys ever interacted with barney frank you could not if you showed a powerpoint to barney frank he'd walk out of the room it, it was a, uh, you know it's like that's the you do not do that yeah <laughs> So, so I think maybe the, 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 you know, the, the form of communication, uh, to see, you know, what was successful or not might be a good question to ask. If, if there's no more comments or, or questions, if that, I hope that that helps and, uh, very useful thing. Yeah. And I guess with that, then um, we've got to, we can have that stretch after all, right? We've got five, we're actually, uh, 
moving towards the the our, our closing remarks uh Rodney, do you do you want to uh do you want to go first with your closing remarks and if you'd like me to go first kevin i'd be happy to, to yes, go please. first with my closing <laughs> remarks so um now it's been a great couple of days and i think uh, it's, uh really pleased with how things have gone um i do feel feel very strongly that having an advisory council such as COSA for an environmental studies program um, is essential. Um, we're not the biggest in the world. We don't have the most money. We don't have the most people, but you know, our science program informs our decisions on real activity out there. I mean, it's real things going on. Steel's going in the water, accidents happen, stuff's out there. I mean, it's, it's real. Uh, we have to, you know, produce energy for the nation and mineral resources, protect the environment and ensure there's economic and societal benefits. So it's a big, it's a big deal. So I just uh, really feel like we, you know, in our environmental studies program, uh, you know, to have a, a group like this where we can bounce ideas off of, seek advice, engage. And um, I mean, yeah, I was here when we first started and got COSA going and uh, uh I mean, it was a little challenging at first. We kind of had to get to know each other a bit, and you know, there was a, a bit of tension. But I really feel like we can have uh, have these conversations, and I think our scientists too feel like they can come here and say, "Hey, I'm struggling with this problem. You know, can you help me? You know, and kind of open those discussions up." And that's what it should be collegial in that sense. So, so I certainly, uh, you know, I certainly appreciate that. So, but we got to get the science right if we're going to get the decision right. Um, or it's wrong. It could be very, very, very wrong. So, um, so yeah. So just thank you to the committee. Uh, I thought that uh, the invited guests uh, were up right on. I thought that was that was great. Uh, yeah, I thought some great comments. Uh, very helpful. Very thoughtful. I thought our our folks in Bohm did a great job with their presentations, uh, as they they always do. Uh, they were very thorough. Um, I also wanted to. Just give thanks to all of our offices and regions, our study chiefs and our science coordinators. It takes quite a bit to put the study development plan together. So, uh, you know, they really did a good job working on that. And of course, you know, it all comes into Dr. Lilly here who has to put Humpty, Humpty Dumpty together. So thank you, sir. You got uh, very well done. And uh, so I want to thank you for that. Um, yeah. And uh, oh, I. Don't let me forget our acting CEO, Jessica, who's also, you know, in charge of our, our, our contract with the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine. So thanks for keeping the train on the track, you know. So uh, with that, just thank you all. Right on. Well, thank thank you. That's a hard act. That's a hard thank you to follow. But I I, I will uh, express my my gratitude to everyone, too, for, you know, a, a, a open and, and, and thoughtful discussions and you know, I, 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 Rodney, I appreciate your scientists uh, presenting it, but also being open enough to listen because I've certainly worked with a few scientists who don't care to hear a, a constructive criticism, and it, it, you know, it really makes things better when you, when you can have a a talk. I think this committee has developed into a really you know a place where you can have you know good ideas and and uh, and sometimes uh, you know differing uh, opinions, but can be talked about in a you know, far too often now, people are either scared to ask a question or scared to hear a comment or, or are defensive. And so, you know, this, that's, uh, I think, one of the National Academy's main roles is to provide that kind of safe environment to be able to talk and really, really look at it one way or the other. But it was a great job from your 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 staff and, and anything we can do to to help us we're glad to and thank you to the committee for being here and coming in person and those of you online that, that joined in and of course the, the national academy of science you guys did a great job uh running everything smoothly and on time and um yeah so thank you and we'll uh we'll look forward to the next meeting and and uh and with that i guess we'll we'll take a break thank you